growth of industrial Europe, the beginnings of industrialization to 1870. It has often been said that the history of the 19th century Europe was shaped by two revolutions, that is, the French and the industrial. The French Revolution, short and packed with drama, sent ideas of liberty and equality coursing like strong wine through the veins of Europe. Ideas which inspired men for a century or more afterwards to demand a voice in their nation's affairs. But it was the Industrial Revolution, protracted and not at all dramatic, which had the even a greater result in finally transforming the good or ill that is the pattern of everyday life. The Industrial Revolution had been defined as the series of changes by which hand craftsmanship in the home or small workshop gave place as the general mode of industry to machine work in factories. Its birthplace was Britain in the latter 18th century and it was first seen in the manufacture of cotton textiles. The early cotton spinning inventions were often powered by water, and many of the first factories were sited by pushing country streams, but which they meant with the perfection of an efficient steam engine by James Watt in 1770s and its application in the 1781 to 1782 to produce rotary motion, steam became the great motive power. Steam could drive heavy machinery in the factories, first for spinning and a letter for weaving, and steam pumps by draining the mines could win more coal to make more steam. But machinery could not long survive if made as some of the earliest wars from wood. The strength, the permanence, and the precision of iron were needed. So iron tools melted since the mid-18th century by coke made from coal and from 1829 by coal that is directly because one of the pillars of the industrial labor revolution was iron. With the invention of the steam locomotive first used in collectories and in the 1820s perfected by George Stevenson and others, further immense possibilities opened. Soon the railway age began. The improved roads of the latter 18th century with their coaches and carts, the new canals and the house-drawn barges faded into the past as the railways took over. Goods and people were shuffled about in quantities and at speeds still then and I mean undreamed of and the volume of trade doubled and redoubled and behind everything was King Coal. Textiles, the steam engine, the coal, the iron railways and soon steamships, these were the foundations of the new industrial Britain. How swiftly these developments took place in Britain may be seen for, uh, I mean, for, for, from one or two comparison studies, complete statistics are not available, but a fair estimate will be that in the 50 years leading up to 1820, the production of cotton textiles was multiplied by about 20 or of, of coal by two or, and uh, I mean, of peak iron by nearly seven. Britain could not, of course, have become a great industrial power so swiftly had she not already been considered commercial alone. From her commerce, in, uh, including in the 18th century, the lucrative and inquitous slave trade based including in the 18th century, I mean largely on Liverpool, she had built up the capital to invest in other enterprises.
among and uh, among the many other advantages which enabled her to take the lead in industrialization were the possession of a fairly well developed system of banking and insurance as well as her colonies that is the market marine and a powerful navy to guard her trade routes if we add to this Britain that is convenient position for the worldwide trade, the richness of her resource of coal and iron, the comparative stabilities of her government, the long years of internal peace that she had enjoyed and the absence of the internal uh, customers barriers that so restricted trade in most of the continent tall countries were I mean, we see some of the factors which favor the first industrial development in Britain. Growth in population. Industrial development and worldwide trade demanded a good supply of labor. And here Britain was probably helped by the fact that her population was steadily rising. For 1760, before industrialization on any large scale began, the population of Great Britain and Ireland is estimated to have been 11 and a half million. By 1831, as ascertained uh, by official consensus, I mean census, it had arisen to no less than 24 million. So huge a rise was at once a cause of industrial growth, and a, res a result of it was the increased population that helped the industries by providing labor and a market. While the output of the industries helped to sustain the growth in population, the causes of this growth this growth have been much debated, and the uh, general opinion is that the governing factor was not a rise in the birth rate. For before the spread of the artificial birth control in the late 19th century, most married women produced children as frequently as it was physically possible for them to do so. It is true that during the 18th century, people tended uh, for a number of reasons to marry earlier than in the 17th century and so their reproductive span was longer. Nevertheless, the main cause of the increase in population seems to have been something quite different, a fall in the death rate. But what caused the fall in the death rate? Improved medical knowledge, including vaccination against smallpox, better sanitation, the abandonment of the practice of binding infants in swaddling clothes, the long years of internal peace, the growth of wealth of the country from trade, these are doubtlessly some of the reasons. But high on the first must come to the, the increased food supply resulting from the great agricultural improvements of the 18th century. The movement usually known as the agrarian or the agricultural revolution. Increased food supply. The agrarian revolution in Britain, mid 18th century to 1820. The agrarian revolution was at its height in Britain over the years, that is, in 1760 to 1820. Its most striking feature was the transformation of the old open field regions with their scattered strip holding in the impact. Enclosed farms under single ownership. In the process, much common pasture and woodland was enclosed too. Once their holdings were consolidated and enclosed, enterprising owners and tenants could introduce some of the many improved techniques already available. They could, uh, I mean, substitute turnips, for instance, for the fallow period under which most of the old field had lain every third year. This both broke up the soil and provided winter food for cattle. And with root crops, the winter food, uh, and the hedges of the new enclosed farms to provide shelter, cattle had no longer to be killed off in the autumn. Their numbers increased, their quality improved with the selective stock breeding and the ending of the old mingling of the common pasture and the uh, I mean, uh, 
sorry uh, I, I mean of the common pasture and the manure from more beasts brought still greater fertility to the fields all these together with a new devices such as better plows and seed drills to replace wasteful uh, broadcast sowing by hand led to a great increase in the food supply both grain and meat and so played its part in producing and sustaining a larger population Rev I mean revolting social problems Though the agrarian and the industrial revolution together helped to sustain and increase population, they also created many social problems. In agriculture, considerable numbers of the poorest classes in the countryside, those who held no strips in the open field but act out a precarious living from the common pasture and woods, lost their customary foothold in the village where most of the common was closed. Having no legal share in the main lands of the village, they often got no recompense for their loss of customary, if unofficial, rights. This together with the fact that many of the new allocations of land were too small to be worked economically as individual units and were soon sold off to the wealthier neighbors helped to produce a class of landless rural laborers with wages very low in relation to the high food prices of the years during the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. These men suffered bitterly and in the worst years survived only by humiliating grants of parish poor relief. This particular pattern of events, however, was not to be closely followed either in France, where a large piece of proprietor class emerged from the revolution, or in the Eastern Europe, where the great estates, untouched by modern improvements, long continued to depend on the compulsory labor of serfs. Urban Problems it was in the towns, however, that the most glaring social problems arose. This was partly because with the growth of the population in the 18th century, the older towns became more and more overcrowded. More or bigger families crowded in each house and small dwellings sprung up in the, in the, in the gardens and crowded into the, each house and small, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the existing local authorities could not cope with this additional burden and in many of the older towns such as London, York and Bristol, slums area, I mean slum areas proliferated. Trouble also arose because the industrial growth in the north and in the midlands created virtually new towns at great speed and without any uh, proper control. The small market town of uh, Manchester, for instance, in 1773 appears to have had a population of 36,000 people. By 1851, the number had swollen to over 300,000. In the textile districts of uh, Lancashire and in the coal and iron regions of the Midlands and in the North Karst, where apart from London the biggest concentrations of population were occurring, builders ran up thousands of biggest concentrations of populations, terraces of cheap houses depressingly uniform in style and sometimes built back to back to keep costs to a minimum. The new terraces, the factories, and even the fields nearby were soon blackened by the prevailing smoke of industrial neighborhoods. All the problems of urban areas without proper sanitation or recreational facilities, other than too many pubs, soon appeared. Disease, squalor, drunkenness, and crime. In time, local improve, uh, mean, improvement commissions and elected town councils brought some cleanliness and uh, order to the expanded towns, but half of the 19th century passed before the worst was over. The hours and conditions of work during the Industrial Revolution also constituted a grave social problem. 
the atmosphere in many factories was almost unbearable, I mean unbearably hot and moist. Much dangerous machinery was unfenced, falls and flooding in the mines were commonplace. In addition, competition between farms was keen, not to say cut throat, and profit margins were small, with the result that the factory operatives, of whom there was an almost unlimited supply, had to work uh, 12 or 14 hours a day to keep alive. Their wages were higher than those in the agriculture, but still far too low to satisfy ordinary human need. To supplement their scanty pay, many farmers, I mean fathers, sent their children into factories at the age of five or even less, and since no long train was necess training was necessary, female labor quickly became one of the staple of the whole factory system. In most factories, harsh discipline ruled, with fines for the adults and as troublings for the children, and many workers wore themselves out in the long hours of keeping pace with the machines. Years of agitation by enlightened individuals, the formation of trade unions for long forbidden, and at length the intervention by the government in the form of factory and mine acts were all required before the lord of the industrial workers became much better. Increase in British power Though this book is not, in general, concerned with events inside Britain, this development had been described for two reasons. The first is that it, it, it so increased the wealth and power of Britain that she was able, through Amina, throughout the 19th century, to play a role in, the, in, in Europe and world affairs, out of all proportion to her size. The second is that this kind of development was followed as at some distance in time and of course with important local differences by similar developments in other European countries. By recalling what happened in Britain, we have some clue to the nature of the changes elsewhere. At the time of the French Revolution, the most advantage, uh, advanced countries in Europe from the point of view of industry apart from Britain were France. The long was under the Republic and Napoleon, however, slowed down her rate of progress. The first country to show signs of matching the pace of the British development was in fact the new state of Belgium, established in 1830. Her geographical position astride the northern routes from France to Germany, which had caused her territory to be fought over throughout the centuries and earned it the nickname of the cockpit of uh, Europe, was a great advantage. So too were her fine traditions in clothes, making and iron work, and the existence of many thriving commercial towns dating the Middle Ages. Coal miners, too, were already working in the 18th century on what was to become Belgian soil. The government of the new country under King Leopold I, following its severance from Holland, was quick to encourage commercial and industrial growth, and the state took an early lead in sponsoring railways. This began in 1833 and by 1844 a system of trunk lines was completed, covering the main route to France, Germany, Holland and Britain. After the other lines until 1870, the whole system was brought under state control. This development was marked, uh, matched in other ways. Great attention was paid to canals, which continued to play the important part in the transit of goods. Belgian production of coal, greatest around Liege, that is troubled between 1830 and 1860, and as late as 1870, she was still mining more coal than France. Even so, it was not enough for her growing industrial needs. She had to import more from Britain. Equally outstanding was the Belgian production of iron, that is metal goods, including machinery and textile. 
one family at least of the new industrialists uh, was the British or of British origin, that is the Corker Reels. The father, John, a wandering mechanic from Lancashire and a reputed, a reputedly illiterate, established himself at the Veers in 1798 as a manufacturer of textile machinery and imported one of Ward's steam engines. His son John founded a great iron and machinery work at the, that is as a ser, 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 serraing which by 1837 boasted four coal pits, two blast furnaces and various rolling mills. It made locomotives and all kinds of machinery. All told, Belgium, under a free trade policy geared like that of Britain to exporting a manufactured good and becoming partly dependent on imported food, had developed by 1870 into a considerable industrial power. Even so, her output of coal and iron was only a tenth of Britain's. The next power to experience any considerable industrial development was France. Though industry in France never gained the same ascendancy over agriculture as it did in Britain and Belgium. Despite or perhaps because of French skills in handicrafts, mechanization of fairly slow, we I mean was fairly slow to develop. One reason was that for long France had no great supplies of coal. Nearly all her coal fields were small, and one of the biggest in the Nord and Pars de Calais was not fully surveyed or greatly worked until 1850. Her output did increase steadily from one and three quarter of a million tons to, uh, I mean, in 1828 to over five million tons in 1847 and over 13 million tons in 1869, but she still had to import coal to satisfy her slowly growing industries. If France's production of 13 million tons in 16, uh, 1869 is compared with Britain's uh, 107 million tons in the same year, the extent of Britain's lead is clear. In a pig, pig iron, France came a little near to matching Britain's output. In 1847, for instance, she produced just over 590,000 tons, while Britain produced 2 million tons. Most of France's production, however, still came from hundreds of small charcoal furnaces in the woodland areas. Sometimes was to, uh, uh, some time was to elapse before the coke and coal smelting methods used, for instance, at the great iron works at uh, Les Crute became general. Not surprisingly, in these circumstances, when uh, uh, France began to lay down a railway during the 1840s, she hired at first to import the lines from Britain. France's railway age proper began in 1845. The trunk routes, more systematically planned than those of Britain, radiated from Paris into six main areas and were built by a mixture of state and private enterprise. In general, the state provided the land and the roadbed for the lines and controlled geographical distribution, fares and freight rates, and safely, uh, safety standards. The promoting companies provided the equipment including rails and rolling stock, ran the services and took the profits if any. Under this system, France managed to build nearly 2,000 miles of a route by 1850, at which time Britain had over 6,000 and nearly 11,000 by 1870. Even at the date, however, the mileage in Britain, a much smaller country, was nearly half as great again. In the textile industry too, France advanced, but again in most branches, uh, far more slowly than Britain, for cotton spinning and weaving a factory system had developed from the 1820s and by 1846 there were 10,000 power looms in operation. Britain at this time had about 200,000. The silk industry was well developed and quadrupled between 1815 and 1850. But production was later hampered by a disease which affected silkworms. In 
there was also an extensive linen industry, but this was still carried on largely by the uh, village weavers and by the housewives producing only for the need of their family. Indeed, in textiles, as in most other traders, trades and industries, the small workshop for long continued to be far more characteristic of France than the factory. We have seen how Napoleon I had tried to encourage French agriculture, industrial and commerce and how his efforts had been largely nullified by his constant indulgence in war. One future success, however, lay in the introduction of the sugar beet as a substitute for cane sugar. Under the restoration of the government, uh, canals were built, railways started and the first factories act passed. It was not until the reign of Napoleon III that industrial progress became fairly rapid. The emperor himself was genuinely interested in promoting commerce as many uh, uh, be seen for from Britain and Paris exhibition in 1855 held the imitation of the Crystal Palace exhibition in 1851 and from his eagerness to conclude a, a commercial treaty such as the Cord uh, Cobden that is Chevalier Treaty in 1860 leading to the free trade with other countries. His big programs of public works in Paris and elsewhere created much employment. And the acquisition of colonies in Indochina led to greater French trade which with the Far East. All told, during the period of the Second Empire, France's foreign trade roughly trebled. In fact, that France's industrial development was slow and patchy did not uh, mean that she escaped the horrors which were the black side of industrialization in Britain. They merely occurred in a few places. Until the late 19th century, the population of France, though not increasingly nearly as fast of, as of Britain or Germany, was nevertheless steadily growing. A growth aided by improvements in agriculture notably the elimination of fallow land in uh, favor of root crop and cultivated meadows of clover, that is, uh, La Lausanne and uh, Saint Foin. Some of this growth population found work in, uh, uh, work in, in textile factories, that is, the foundries and mines, where conditions were just as bad as Britain. Others concentrated in the big towns such as Paris and Lyon, which grew greatly in size without providing comparable increases in available work. The result was overcrowding, insanitary conditions, a low standard of living, and widespread discontent among the poorer classes. This expressed itself in the growth of socialism and in at least two bitter crash clashes in Paris, that is the June days of 1848 and the fight of the communards in 1871. Germany. Fourth in the League of the European Industrial Development by 1870 was Germany. The political disunity of the country held up industrial progress and the delay will have been greater by uh, but the gradual extension of the Zulverein or customs union over most of German states between 1834 and 1844. Apart from the railways, the first in uh, 1835 was a small railway in uh, Bavaria, and the next, uh, that is, and the next in 1839, a line between Leipzig and Drankestein. This was partly due to the propaganda of uh, Friedrich List, an economist who had returned to Germany following exile in the USA on account of his political views. Leipzig uh, Dre Dresden Railway in Saxony was a great success and according to one historian in the first year it carried for, for 12,000 people, some lady travelers keeping needles in their mouths to prevent familiarity in the darkness of the single tunnel. From 1840 construction was first and by 1850 the route mileage in britain in sorry in germany was nearly twice that of france and over half of that of britain most of this progress was due to the various state governments which with some notable exceptions such as prussia built their railways and kept them under state ownership <laughs>
coal, iron and textiles. Thanks to the Zolve rain and the railways, Germany was able to make up some of the leeway during uh, the years of 1850 to 1870. In the first half of the 19th century, her roads had been poor and her industry mostly in the medieval handicraft that is tradition, uh, uh, tightly bound by the guild regulations. Exceptions had been uh, the production of the coal which considerably exceeded that of France in Prussia territory, that is Silesia and uh, the Rhineland, that is the rural area, and of iron in Bohemia, a province of the Austrian Empire. In Hamburg uh, and uh, Bremen there were sugar refineries and uh, various seaport industries, and in Saxony there were a growing number of cotton textile factories in which children slept during busy times from 5 a.m. to 8 p.m. On the whole, however, large-scale enterprises were rare. Production of wool and cloth and linen, for instance, and even the mining of metals still remained largely peasant industries. From about 1850, this picture slowly began to change. The most striking advances encouraged by the developments in banking as well as better communications were in the production of coal and iron and the growth of the arms industry. The farm of uh, Krupp, founded uh, at uh, Sen in the, in, in the rural in 1810, was uh, by 1846 employing no more than 140 people out of the town's population of 8,000. By 1870, after Alfred Krupp had promised uh, highly successful cast steel guns and wireless steel tires for railway vehicles, it dominated the town, which had mushroomed to a population of over 50,000. Another famous concern was the uh, Nord Red Chair Liode shipping farm of the Brigham men, founded in 1857, but perhaps the most important development of all as the basis of electric power, the new electric industry was the invention of 1866 of the dynamo by Ernst, that is Wiener, von Siemens, a scientist who had earlier specialized in the development of the electric telegraph. Germany is still largely agricultural in 1870. It had taken the occupation of the Rhineland by the French in the Revolution and Napoleonic periods to the end, uh, that is, uh, to end many medieval practices and start the general emancipation of the serfs. A process soon followed in Prussia and completed after the Revolution of 1848. In Western Germany, this led to much peasant ownership, but in Eastern Germany, the tradition of huge estates and dominant landlords, a legacy of the medieval Germany, advanced to the East as conquerors, remained strong well into the 20th century. Urbanization in Britain, Germany and France one way we can perhaps measure the progress of industrialization in the three countries of Britain, France and Germany is to consider the extent to which their population began to live in towns. Towns do not, of course, imply industrialization, but industrialization almost inevitably implies the growth of towns. It has been calculated that the date when more people began to live in towns than in the country in Britain was during the 1850s. For Germany, the corresponding date was around 1900. For instance, the date has not yet arrived. Other countries. Outside these three countries and Belgium, Industrialization in 1870 was still in its infancy in Europe. The wealth of Holland depended on agriculture and overseas trade. She still retained an extensive empire in Southeast Asia. In Italy, progress was largely confined to Piedmont and Genoa, where uh, Cavour's encouragement of roads, railways, ports, facilities, banks and commerce was beginning to show results. Spain and Portugal had important trading links, particularly with their overseas colonies or ex-colonies, but their industry was small-scale and traditional. 
The same may be said of the industry of uh, uh, Australian Empire, which was centered largely in Bohemia. Much more important was the agricultural production in the Great Hungarian Plains. Sweden among the uh, Scandinavian countries was developing, promising that is uh, me, 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 metallurgical and engineering industries. The Balkan nations were not touched by large-scale industry of any kind. Switzerland was known for agricultural products, producing cloaks, but not yet, of course, for electrical goods. Finally, what's of the 20th century industrial giant Russia? Like the rest of Europe's, Russia population was increasing. In her case, the increase uh, was very fast, doubling in the first half of the 19th century and again in the second. Part of this increase came from territorial expansion. But still, nearly at the end of the country century, the, the increase was not ac accompanied by much industrialization. Railways, though, began fairly early was slowly to develop. By 1870, the length of route in enormous Russia was still less than half that in tiny Britain. Her way of life was rural and conservative and until the 1860s based in on serfdom. In St. Petersburg, Moscow and Warsaw were a few large factories, mainly for state enterprises in uh, textile and armaments but the number of industrial workers was only 1% of the population. Not till in the 1890s did this position significantly change, so Britain in 1870 was still virtually unchallenged in her economic supremacy. She still enjoyed much, if not all, of the position she had attained in 1850, a position in which she had established herself according to one historian that is, as he said, as not only the workshop of the world, but also as the shipper, trader, and to a large extent, the banker of the world. From 1840 to 1914, the growth of large-scale industries in Europe continued rapidly after 1870, despite several periods of trade depression. The countries in which this growth was clearly strongest, Britain, Belgium, France and Germany, underwent further industrialization, and many others such as Austria, Hungary, Sweden and Russia took their first big steps along the same path. To states beyond Europe, however, the USA and Japan showed an even greater rate of the industrial and commercial growth just when the outpost of European industries was rising to heights previously unknown, industrialization was spreading to the world outside, with the results that were eventually to undermine not only the industrial but also the political supremacy of Europe. Well beyond 1914, coal remained by far the most important source of Europe's industrial energy. It was used for direct heat, as in metals melting, or for production of steam to drive locomotives, ships and all kinds of machinery. Often it was employed in the form of coal gas, with the improvement of the dynamo and in 1870 and the invention of Parsons steam turbine in 1884. Steam raised from coal was also used to generate that most convenient new form of power, electricity. Outside Europe, arrival to coal as a prime source of energy was now indeed beginning to appear. Mineral oil, which was to surpass coal in the capacity by the mid-20th century, became, became widely available after the sinking of the first oil well in Penislavia in 1859. Penislavian oil, however, like that already available in the 1850s from Austria, Galicia and Romania was used mainly for lighting. It enabled paraffin lamps and paraffin wax candles to brighten even every home. 
It was not until 1870s and 1880s that Father Wells in Russia and Ohio, followed by those of Texas and Italy in 1890s, gave oil suitable for raising steam to drive machinery. In the refined form of petrol, oil also drove the newly invented internal combustion engines of the 1880s. These engines made possible the motor car and later the aeroplane. Cars, however, were still a minor means of transport in 1814 and the aer aer aeroplane. That is uh, hardly one at all compared with railways. Oil was by that date also used to fire the furnaces of ships, notably naval vessels and big liners where speed used uh, uh, space saving and uh, comparative smokeless was very important in the USA and to all a lesser degree in the Far East where discoveries were made in uh, Borneo, Burma, the Dutch East Indies and Japan. Oil was by 1914 already used as a source of power in uh, factories and electrical generating stations. Elsewhere, coal still remained king. Coal production The need for coal gave greater advantages to the countries which had good natural supplies and especially therefore at first to Britain, Germany and the USA. In Britain, coal production went up from about 159 million tons a year during 1880 to 1884 to about 274 million tons a year during 1910 to 1914. This was the highest total achieved by one country in Europe. The increase in Britain's coal production, however, was exceeded by, the, uh, the, the, by that of Germany, which rose from 66 million tons a year in uh, 1886 uh, to 1884 uh, you know, uh, in the United States, where coal production rose from about 18 tons a year in the early 1880s to the huge figure of 474 million tons a year in 1810 to 1814. Sorry for that repeat. Apart from coal, the main basis of heavy industry was iron and steel, with the latter now replacing the former in prime importance. In 1880, Britain was producing more nearly twice as much big iron as the United States and nearly three times as much as Germany. By 1910, though her own output had gone up, she was producing only about half as much as Germany and only about a third as much as the United States. Britain's considerable advance, which kept her well ahead of, the, uh, of France, was quite overshadowed by that of Germany and America. It was during 1860s that steel first began to overtake iron in industrial use. This was because such inventions as the blast furnace, the, 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 the Bessemer converter of the 1856, and the open heart process of the 1860s readily gave temperatures previously difficult to obtain so greatly accelerated production and reduced cost. This steel, however, was not so strong as that made of the old-fashioned crucibles. Moreover, certain classes of iron ore, those with a high prosperous, I mean phosphorus content, could not at first be dealt with by these new processes. It took the uh, Gilchrist Thomas, you know, invention of the 1870s in which alkali, mainly lime, was both mixed with a metal and used as a lining to the converter to solve this problem. The phosphorus was absorbed into the alkali and removed as basic slug which proved to be a useful fertilizer. Henceforth, the phosphoric ores came into general commercial use and the universal supremacy of steel was quickly established. This development was of special benefit to Sweden which had large quantities of phosphoric iron ore in the north. It also helped Germany, which had acquired rich deposits in the ore fields of Lorraine taken from France in 1871. Germany and the USA surpassed Britain. Not surprisingly, the production figure of steel tell much the same story of those of coal and iron. 
Between 1880 and 1910, Britain multiplied her output by five, but Germany by nearly 20. By 1910, Germany was producing twice as much as Britain. In the other main steel production countries too showed a great array uh, of increase than Britain, though with one other big exception they remained well behind her in total output. This exception was the transatlantic giant the USA whose output increased from one uh, I mean, uh, from 1.3 million tons in 1880 the same as Britain's to no less than 2. 26.5 million tons over four times that of Britain in 1910. The increased production of coal, iron and steel was essential to the development of most other industries. Among the older ones, textiles and shipbuilding continued to expand, while striking advances were made in the new chemical and electrical industries. In all this, Germany, among the European powers, was particularly outstanding. In textile, for instance, she began to produce uh, a worsted combed wool, clothed in large quantities after 1870, at the same time as mechanization brought about a greater growth in her cotton industry. By the beginning of the 20th century, she was a large exporter with textile ranking fourth in the value of her exports after iron and steel, machinery and coal and coke. Similarly, in the shipbuilding, Great new yards were established at Hamburg, Bremen, and Stettin, and Germany. Output of steam propelled vessels rose from 100,000 tons in 1870 to 2.3 million tons in 1910. Apart from coal, the main basis of heavy industry was iron and steel, that is, with the latter now replacing the former in prime importance. In 1880, Britain was producing nearly twice as much pig iron as the United States and nearly three times as much as Germany. By 1910, though her own output had gone up, she was producing only half as much as Germany and only about a third as much as the United States. Britain's considerable advance which kept her well ahead of France was quite overshadowed by that of Germany and America. It was during 1860s that steel first began to overtake iron in industrial use. This was because such inventions as the blast furnace, the Bersama converter of 1856, and the open hut, that, that is hard processes of the 1860s, readily gave temperatures previously difficult to obtain and so greatly accelerated production and reduced costs. This still, however, not so strong. As, to make, as, as that made in the old-fashioned crucibles. Moreover, certain classes of iron ore, those with a high phosphorus content, could not at first be dealt with by these new processes. It took the Gilchrist Gil Gil Thomas invention of the 1870s in which alkali, mainly lime, was both mixed with a metal and used as a lining to the converter to solve this problem. The phosphorus was absorbed into the alkali and removed as a basic slug, which proved to be a useful fertilizer. Henceforth, the phosphoric ores came into general commercial use and the universal supremacy of steel was quickly established. This development was of special benefit to Sweden, which has large quantities of phosphorus iron ore in the north. It also helped Germany, which had acquired rich deposits in the oil field of uh, L Lorraine, taken from France in 1871. Not surprisingly, the production figures of steel tell much the same story of those of coal and iron. Between 1880 and 1910, Britain multiplied her output by five, but Germany by nearly 20. By 1910, Germany was producing twice as much as Britain. All the other main steel producing countries too showed a great rate of increase than Britain, though with one thing exception, they remained well behind her in the total output.
This exception was the transatlantic giant, the USA, whose output increased from 1.3 trillion uh, million tons in 1880, the same as Britain's, to no less than 26.5 million tons, over four times that of Britain in 1910. Other industries. The increased production of coal, iron and steel was essential to the development of most other industries. Among other older ones, textile and shipbuilding continued to expand, while striking advances were made in the new chemical and electrical industries. In all this, Germany, among the European powers, was particularly outstanding. In textiles, for instance, she began to produce wasted, you know, sorry, uh, worsted, that is combed wool, clothing in large quantities after 1870. At the same time, her machinization brought about a great growth in her cotton industry. By the beginning of the 20th century, she was a large exporter, with her uh, textiles are ranking further in the value of her exports after iron and steel, machinery and coal and coke. Similarly, in shipbuilding, great new yards were established in Hamburg, Bremen and uh, Stratin, and German output of steam propelled vessels rose from 100,000 tons in 1870 to 2.3 million tons in 1910. That is shipbuilding. In chemical products, too, Germany began to rival Britain. The acknowledged leader, that is, among these products was soda by the ammonia soda process, that is, which was patented in 1860s by the Belgian Solvay. Chlorine required for bleaching powder and sulfuric acid by a process invented in Britain which replaced the older lead chamber method. One great use of a sulfuric acid was in the production of artificial fertilizers, especially that is the superphosphates. These chemicals, together with other fertilizers like nitrates, imported largely from uh, Chile, and salts of potassium rich deposits of which were discovered in Germany in the 1870s, greatly stimulated that is the production of crops and so helped to feed the world's fast growing population. Other branches of the chemical industry in which Germany excelled were the production of synthetic, that is, the dye stuffs, where she soon eclipsed the originator, Britain, and the manufacture of the explosives based on nitroglycerin. The basic invention here were those of a dynamite in 1860 and a plastic gelatin, gel, 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 gelatin a little later by the Swede Alfred Nobel. Their uh, main uh, counterparts for shells and bullets, um, and in, in, in Nobel's smokeless propellant, ballistite, and the British invention, uh, that is the cordite, revolutionized armaments uh, towards the close of the 19th century. New electrical industry. Equally important, both the Germany and for Europe as a whole, was the new electric industry. The effect of this on everyday life was enormous. By the 1860s, our lamps, based on a discharge between carbon electrodes that is, were available for lighthouses, streets, theaters, and other public uses. But for electricity to be used generally for lighting in the home required not only the development of a public supply, but also the invention of a cheap and a practicable carbon filament lamp. This was achieved by the Englishman Swan and the American Edison almost simultaneously at the end of 1870s. From then on, helped by the German invention of the incandents, incandent gas mantle of the late 1880s, man's age-old battle against the dark was won. Cities became far safer at night and an immense range of leisure pursuits both in the home and outside, became possible for the first time in the evening hours. Another application of electricity following the invention of suitable motors was uh, for traction. An electric railway was first uh, shown at the Berlin exhibition in 1879. Very soon it became apparent that steam railway could be electrified. 
this, however, was for a long time less important than the development of cheap street transport in the form of electric, that is, tram car. Most big European cities converted their tram car system, originally operated by horses, but sometimes by steam to electricity during the 1890s and 1900s. And this, with the growth of suburban railways, enabled the workers to live well away from their place of employment and the cities themselves to become even larger. Communication already revolutionized before 1870 by the railway and the steamship, was thus advanced still further in the 1890s by the introduction of electric trams and trains, including underground systems in London, Budapest, Paris, and other great cities at, you know, as time went on. To this, we added the petrol, uh, was added the petrol, a driven car, invented in the mid 1880s and later the motor bus, while, while safe safety bicycles and uh, pneumatic tires had been available from the late 1880s. For the first time in history, man became highly mobile locally without the aid of the horse. Communication at a distance, telegraph, telephone, and wireless. The revolution did not stop there. Other inventions depend, that is, which were dependent on electricity also enabled man to communicate at a distance. From the 1830s, the electric telegraph carried along wires and later by submarine cables to regions further and further afield, already enabled messages to be sent in code and now in the mid 1870s the invention of the telephone by graham bell in the united states had an immense but incalculable effect on both business and social life finally the development of wireless telegraphy by Marconi and others around the turn of the century and uh, you know and already already used by the 1914 for communication between ships and from aircraft in Introduced what then seemed the most incredible innovation of all. In the manufacture associated with these developments, in the making of generating plant, electric and petrol motors, cables and wires, electric lamps, telephones, and many other things, the United States soon became the leading power. But Germany ran her very close. For 1913, Germany's output of electricity or electric products and equipments is estimated to have been worth about uh, 65 million pounds. For the same date, uh, that of Britain was worth less than half, that is 30 million pounds, and that of France, seven and three quarters million pounds. Though Germany made herself the greatest industrial producer in Europe by 1914, at that date she was still well behind Britain in the extent of value for her trade. From about 1870, Britain gradually ceased to be the workshop of the world, but she remained the world's main exporter, importer, and financier. She was also still the world's main carrier, that is, owning by 1914 about three-sevenths of the world's total tonnage of shipping. In Europe, that is, Germany came next with about a quarter, with about a quarter uh, Britain's tonnage and France's that with less than half of Germany's. The income earned from abroad by Britain's shipping was very large, as was that brought in by overseas investments and by services like banking and insurance. In all the uh, I mean apparatus of commerce, Britain was still the most highly developed country, but during the final quarter of the 19th century, similar facilities became available on a large scale elsewhere. With the development of communications and the network of commerce institutions, banks, insurance and shipping offices, stock and commodity exchanges, and the like, trade became truly worldwide. Industrial growth in Russia. It is impossible in this short sketch to trace the industrial progress, considerable though it was of such countries as Sweden, Austria-Hungary, 
Italy and Switzerland, or to consider why development of this kind was much slower in other areas such as the Balkans, Spain and Portugal. Attention must however be drawn to the remarkable industrial growth achieved by Russia even if it was only a beginning and left her still well down the table of industrial nations. Though there was a good deal of progress after the emancipation of the serfs, the real spot began in the 1890s with the appointment of the railway administrator, that is the Sergius Witte as France's minister and the uh, beginning of direct state intervention in key industries. This was greatly helped by French and Belgium loans and by British investments in the new oil industry centered in Baku. Between 1890 and 1914, by such ventures as the Great Trans-Siberian Line, Russia doubled the length of her railway system to give her what she obviously needed, the longest route of mileage of any European power. Between the same dates, she also quadrupled her output of coal and achieved an even greater increase in her production of iron ore and steel. Especially notable was the development of the Ukraine into a great industrial as well as grain producing region. The spur to all this may be seen in the fact that during Wittish periods of power from 1892 to 1903, no less than two-thirds of government expenditure was devoted to industrial expansion. Largely due to this and foreign loans, Russia, uh, industry as a whole achieved during the 19, uh, 1890s the fastest growth rate in the world, a rate not to be matched in Russia again until 1950s. Trade cycles. One feature of industrial and commercial growth which became still clearer during the years of 1817 and, and 1914 was the, that of the, the, the trade, tend, uh, trade tended to move in cycles of prosperity and depression. A period of three or four years of continuous expansion will, uh, you know, lead to overproduction in relation to the purchasing power of the customers, and then a drop in prices to re-attract custom uh, and a laying off of workers to economize in costs of scale, uh, you know, or scale down. Uh, output to demand. After a while, the contracted output will will pick up again. There are about six periods of depression in Western Europe between 1870 and 1914 that is the severest what we should all slay, we should call slums occurring in 1873 to 1876 and 1893 to 1896 since they created unemployment and the state helped for the unemployment was then almost non-existent. They were naturally marked by acute social unrest. Complicating factors. This simple trade cycle was however often complicated by the very important outside factor which affected prices. One of these was the amount of gold, the basis of the world's currency available, fresh discoveries of gold as in California and Australia in the mid 19th century or South Africa in the 1880s could cause a rise in general prices by making gold itself less valuable for sellers of goods naturally demand higher prices as more decline in value. Another disturbing factor that is frequently in the 19th century could be some great new invention. A new machine might machinize a particular industry and drive out the hand workers as the power loom had done or a new substance might undercut and replace existing articles, that is plastics and artificial silk were late, were late 19th century examples. That complicating factor could be some new development in transport. The steamship, for example, coupled with the completion of the Suez Canal in 1869, which dramatically improved the reliability and journey time and opened up some previously inaccessible parts of the world. This might both enlarge the demand for European manufactured goods and at the same time make available 
to Europe such large quantities of food or raw materials from the newly accessible regions as to alter greatly the previous pattern of trade. Great Agricultural Depression, that is in 1870s to the 1890s. The most striking example of this in the late 19th century was the prolonged depression which affected much of Western European agriculture. To the temporary effects of general trade depression in 1873 to 1876 and exceptionally had a, you know, uh, bad harvest in Western Europe shortly afterwards were added to much more important long-term effects of the arrival of food from the overseas, that is, in vastly, in vastly increased quantities. The main cause here were the opening of the huge territories such as Argentina, the American and Canadian Middle West, Australia and New Zealand, thanks uh, in a large part of the railway and in a reliable and inexpensive carriage of their food products to Western Europe by steamship. In particular, the virgin soil of the Middle West yielded floods of cheap gain, for expensive fertilizers were at first unnecessary while the invention of the refrigeration made it possible for great meat exporting industry to grow up in the Argentina and New Zealand. These things combined to expose Western Europe agriculture to competition such as it had never previously experienced. Corn could not be produced as cheaply in Europe as it was pouring in from North America and much arable land went out of cultivation. The severity of the effect on Western Europe agriculture, the industrial workers of course benefited from cheap food and subsistence farming in Europe, in Eastern Europe that is, it was not much affected. Varied from country to country, Britain was especially hard hit because unlike France and Germany she maintained her free trade system and declined to set up protective tariffs tar only in the closing years of the 19th century as North American grain beca be be became dearer to produce did British agriculture begin to pick up and only in the first world war when home produced food supply suddenly became important gain did it better that is really revive most other countries though similarly affected managed rather better in this case of Holland and Denmark. This was done by specializing in dairy products and exporting these at attractive yet profitable prices. Growth of population. Among the results of industrial growth and an increased food supply was the ability to sustain large populations. In Europe, the population rose from about 266 million in 1850 to about 460 million in 1914, while the least another, at least another 50 million immigrated during this period to North America and elsewhere. Most countries in Europe, including Britain, Germany and Russia, showed a large increase, almost a doubling, but in France the increase was small, doubtless because artificial means of birth control became widely practiced there earlier than in the rest of Europe. Urbanization. Urbanization and increased population meant continued urban growth. Between 1817 and 1914, almost every country in Europe developed a number of large cities. Britain was the first country in which more people began to live in towns than in rural areas. This had happened already in the 1850s and by 1914 nearly four-fifths of her people lived in towns in Germany. By the same date the figure was about three-fifths. In France, on the other hand, where agriculture maintained its old high place, rather more people continued to live in the country than in towns. At the far end of the scale in Russia, probably less than one-tenth of the population lived in towns before 1914. Movements to benefit the masses. <laughs> 
The growth of large-scale industry and the concentration of people in towns with all the attendant social problems stimulated movements to improve the lot of the workers. Among these was the trade union movement. In nearly every Europe country during this period, workers succeeded, often against long-sustained opposition by the government in establishing trade unions so that they would be in a better position to begin with their employers. In Britain, full legal recognition of trade unions was achieved by 1871. In France and Spain, it followed in the 1880s, in Germany in the 1890s, in Russia not till 1906. Usually, the first unions were of the more skilled and better paid workers. Later, mass unions developed and with them the size uh, and severity of strikes. Cooperative societies. Together with this went growth in movements for cooperative production, that is, uh, as in Danish dairy farming, or distribution, as in the British cooperative societies. At the same time, socialist movements of various kinds aiming at everything from social improvement by state action and the complete abolition of private enterprise began to spread and gain momentum in Britain, where most socialists were ready to work, though through, through parliamentary democracy the movement did not become very influential until a number of groups united to form the Labour Party in the 1900. On the continent, socialism was already important. Some years earlier than this, in Germany, despite the hostility of Bismarck, a strong socialist party managed to establish itself during 1870s. By 1914, it was the largest party in the Reich. I mean, the, the, the Reichstag. By the 1890s, socialism was also a considerable force in France, Spain, and Italy. It also existed in Russia, where, in the absence of any substantial progress towards democracy, it was naturally of a revolutionary kind. In fact, most socialists on the continent were revolutionary, mainly believers in their theories of Karl Marx. They held that the, way, the, 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 the wielders of economic and therefore political power the 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 so sorry sorry the the the, the industrialists and capitalists who had taken over from the nobility should themselves be dispossessed by the broad mass of the working people that is the pre the 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 proli the 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 the, 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 the proletariat. they did not imagine that this could come about without a revolution or violence in practice, however, most of the socialists, sorry, most of the socialist parties were willing to work within existing parliamentary system to get what benefits they could for the workers, at least for the time being. Disagreement between the more and the less revolutionary socialists, however, were often acute, and so were the disagreements between socialists who wished to seize the state and use its power on behalf of the, that is, pro, 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 proletariat and anarchists who wished, as far as possible, to do away with state power altogether. Such disagreements helped to wreck the first attempt at the International Social Organization, that is the International Working Men's Association, usually known as the first international founded by the Karl Marx in 1864 and dissolved in 1876. This then are some of the general forces to be born in the mind of we follow the course of the political event in Europe through the years 1870 to 1914. During that period, Europe was advancing industrially and technologically at a greater rate than ever before, and possibly since. It was a Europe near doubling in its population and changing in some of its northwest but not yet in its southeastern regions into a land of city dwellers.
it was a Europe responsible in 1870 for nearly two-thirds of the world's industrial output, a Europe which became sorry because of its economical power and technical superiority was able to dominate less developed continents. Imperialism so it was also a Europe which grabbed other territories with ease, as in Africa or Indochina, adding between 1878 and 1914 eight and a half million square miles of its overseas empires. By 1914, Europe, its colonies and its former colonies such as the USA and South America together covered nearly 85% of the world's surface. Uh, the Europe of those years was imperialistic Europe in the heyday of its power. Industrial advance outside Europe, that is Japan and the USA. At the same time, there were countries outside Europe which were steadily growing in strength. Russia beginning to industrialize was acquiring vast tracts of land in Asia and turning herself into a world power rather than a purely European, uh, European one. Japan had emerged from isolation and she too was taking sudden and dramatic strides along the path of industrialization and imperialism. Above all, the United States, having survived a terrible civil war in 1861 to 1865, was progressing industrially at an even faster rate than Western Europe, with her population, that is, trebling, trebling between 1860 and 1910, her huge natural resources, and her vast increase in industrial production, which by 1914 was about 35% of the entire world output. The USA was said to become the world's superpower. By the 1890s, in terms of output and income per head, she was already the world's richest nation. But in international politics outside the American hemisphere, her influence was not yet great. She had a long tradition of avoiding European and colonial enlargements of isolation in foreign affairs. Though she already had the economic power to exert worldwide pressure on the international scene, she did not yet make a systematic attempt to do so. Until 1914, it was still the great European powers who ruled at the international roost. European Tensions Within Europe itself, despite the growing industrial uh, and commercial wealth of the, of the Northwest countries, there were tensions which constantly threatened the stability. Apart from the pressure of first growing populations, the tension between expanding cities and declining countryside, and the sheer pace of technical and social change, there was all the tension arising from demands of, for greater equality. This mainly took the form of the demand by ex uh, ex uh, excluded classes for a vote in, in parliamentary democracy, but there was also the more radical demand for a social state to abolish the capitalist system of free private enterprise. In the sphere of industrial action, there were widespread strikes, even general strikes for better pay. And beyond this, there were all the national tensions between rival industrial powers, like Germany and Britain, or recent enemies like Germany and France, or between subject races and rulers in multinational states like Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. From 1870, Europe was progressing industrially and socially at a pace never known before. But explosive forces were there in plenty and in 18, sorry, in 1914, they, their combustion would spell the end both of the old dynastic Europe and of the long-standing European predominance in the world affairs. The German Empire and the Third French Republic, internal history, from 1871 to 1914. The establishment and internal history of the Third French Republic from 1871 to 1914. The New Germany. The Franco-Prussian War gave a new shape to the situation in Europe. Thanks to Prussian's victory, the process of Italian unity was completed by the capture of the last of the Pope's dominations. 
the empire of Napoleon III, which is, uh, I mean, in 1860 had been the principal power of the continent, crumbled away. And the Republic, which emerged from the ruins, was at first provisional and for many years torn by faction and important. In place of the subsequent or supremacy of France, this arose that of the new German Empire strong in the legions of Moltke and the wheat of Bismarck. A new Europe power had been born, and with it a new European culture. Increasingly, during the next 40 years, men thought of Germany not as a land of great musicians and infectual philosophers, but a land of industrialists, scientists, and soldiers. A distinctive German spirit emerged, evident throughout efficient, patriotic, and ruthless. The old Prussian military tradition became the tradition of the new Germany, fostered by all the Bismarckian ideas on the use of force. The New France Against the powerful new giant in Central Europe, the infant French Republic appeared at first in a pygmy stature. To begin with, it had the greatest difficulty in establishing itself. Between the proclamation of the German Empire at Versailles in January 1871 and the signing of the peace treaty at Frankfurt in the following May, France suffered in the episode of the Paris Commune, one of the most desperate civil conflicts of modern times. When famished, Paris had at last to surrender in January 1871. There was still a party which wanted France to fight on in her and conquered provinces. It disapproved of the idea of the I mean, armistice with uh, the Prussians, although Paris had already endured 135 days of siege and it showed its disapproval by rioting. When the armistice, in spite of this, was concluded, the emergency government formed during the war arranged for a national assembly to be elected at Badiux. The main function of the body was to conclude the peace treaty. To the horror of Paris, with uh, its uh, strong republican tradition, the overwhelming majority of this National Assembly proved to be royalist, a fact that which arose not from the desire of the provinces for monarchy but for peace, which was most strongly supported by the monarchists. The presidency of the assembly was given to the moderate Republican Jewels. That is the, the, the gravy, but the actual uh, direction of affairs as executive was entrusted in the veteran policy, the uh, politician dyers, who had all along been against the war and who wanted to wind it up as speedily as possible. Though previously an Orleans monarchist had now supported a republic, but an extremely conservative one. The ministry he chose was not notable for any strong working class sympathies, and this together with the fact that Thayas was compelled by Bismarck to agree to an official entry into Paris by the Prussian troops put Paris immediately on bad terms with the new government. Two or three measures passed by the assemblies in much added fuel to the flames. In the first place, all the back were rent owing to landlords, commercial sums due and the like with which uh, had been suspended during part of the war were now to be paid up in full with interest, a demand which it was quite impossible for the poor and indeed many of the middle classes to meet. Secondly. The assembly decided to move to Versailles, which had unpleasantly uh, uh, royalist associations. Thirdly, the move to Versailles, which, uh, you know, Paris National Guard was to have its wartime pay stopped and to be disarmed, so that Paris could no longer argue with any effect. When Dias ordered a detachment of French troops to carry out the disarmament, the National Guards in Paris resisted a fight followed, and Paris was in revolt. Paris Commune defies the Assembly at Versailles, March 1871. Before March was out, 
following the example of one or two traditional, uh, traditionally revolutionary cities of the south, such as Lyon and uh, Marseille, Paris had set up a commune or separate town government. The original idea was that the defiance both the conservative republican idea of Dias and the monarchical ideas of the assembly could be defeated. Instead of a single government for the whole country under uh, uh, under Dias or a restored Bourbon king, France will consist of independent communes attached to one another in a very loose form of federation an arrangement which would allow Paris full liberty to carry out its own policy. The Paris Commune itself, when elected, approved a mixed body, its 92 members ranging from extreme revolutionaries to sober middle-class citizens. It was supported by most of Paris except the wealthy West End suburbs. Tires and the Assembly crushed the Commune in May 1871. The assembly at Versailles, however, led by Dias, determined, determined on rigorous suppression. The other communes rapidly collapsed, but for two months civil war raged around Paris under the eyes of the contemptuous Prussians who had the uh, pleasure, you know, uh, pressure labo speculate of watching their enemies destroy one another. Failing to take Paris by assault and the fiercest bombardment, Dias had to ask Bismarck's leave to increase the French army from 80,000 to 150,000 men. Even when, after five weeks continuous attack, the assembly's troops at last broke into Paris, they had to fight their way by street and house by house until they captured the entire city. As the communards retreated, they set fire to important positions, and this together with the incendiary, sorry, incendiary shells used by the Versailles troops reduced half Paris to a blazing inferno. When by 26th May, the last heroic resistance was crushed, the Hotel de Ville, the Ministry of Finance and uh, that is Palais de Justice, uh, the, the, the Tuileries, all were small the ruins, to say nothing of theaters, stations, barracks, and whole blocks of streets. Even Notre Dame was spared only because there was a hospice close by. But the vengeance taken by the victors, sharpened by the communards' murder of hostages, including the Archbishop of Paris, was perhaps even more terrible than the actual fighting. Paris prison slayer and blood, Paris cemeteries burst with the dead who had the revenge of the living by creating false pestilences. Altogether, more than twice the number of victims claimed by the 1793 to 1794 terror in two years perished in Paris in one week, either in the assault or the subsequent executions. It had been estimated that in this episode of the commune, a material damage of the extent of 20 million pounds was done, while about a hundred thousand Persians suffered imprisonment exile, transportation, or death. These disasters appeared on the surface to have very little permanent effect. Dias had re-established himself's sorry order and had not been stopped from concluding the final peace treaty with the Prussians. The ruined buildings were mostly rebuilt in fairly faithful and entire dull copies of the original. This one longer any point in uh, Cook's uh, running uh, sorry in Cook's uh, running special tours to see the damage. Anyway, disappointed British tourists were said to have complained that the ruins were no longer smoking. The commune seemed like a hideous nightmare, no sooner suffered than ended, but it did have very important results. In the first place, it three of the middle classes very solidly behind the government of Dias, while many of the new industrial working classes, resentful and embittered, became ardently socialistic. Secondly, 
The struggles of the Paris rebels to organize themselves into a government were examined critically and historically by the communists Karl Marx, Karl Marx sorry, who drew from them certain principles in the technique of a revolution. Marx's conclusions were later re-examined by the Russian communist Lenin in the early years in the First World War. The history of the commune thus provided a practical lessons for, for the maker of the Great Russian Revolution in 1917. A distant result but nevertheless an important one. Because of the original communards have sometimes uh, been confused with communists, a mystic arising not only from the similarity of the name but from latter communistic admiration for the heroic days of 1871. Liberation of French Territory, 1871-1873. to The first step in the reorganization of, of French was obviously to get rid of the Germans. There was an immediate rush to lend money to the government to pay off the indemnity. And in the middle classes enjoy sorry, and the middle classes enjoyed the pleasures of patriotism while receiving an interest of five percent, a good figure for the time. Within two years the indemnity had been paid off, and France was entirely free from the army of the occupation. The country as a whole coined uh, sorry, sorry, certainly agreed with the assembly in a hailing Thais as a liberator of French territory, though no doubt many of the Paris working classes would have suggested different names. Next, after the army had been reorganized by introducing compulsory service, the actual call up was by Lord came the task of framing a permanent scheme of government for France. A republic had existed since the fall of the empire, and Thais, since August 1871, officially president of the republic, strove hard to preserve it. Yet the majority of the assembly, being royalist, was anxious to abolish the republic, which is regarded as temporary and set up, by a, 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 and set up a monarchy. It thus began to quarrel with Ayas, who resigned in the, uh, in, in the belief that, being indispensable, he would be rapidly invited back as master of the situation. For once, however, the usual, the, 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 the usual shrewd veteran had miscalculated, and the assembly appointed instead of president a royalist, Marshal McMahon. A royalist president, McMahon. At first, the main difficulty of the royalists had been that they could not agree on who should be king. When, however, they reached agreement and Mark Mahon strove to reintroduce the Bourbon monarchy in the person of the Comte de uh, Chambaud, the grandson of Charles X, the negotiations broke down on one detail. Cambaud, an elderly, died in the wool aristocrat. Our aristocrats refused to accept the, the, the tricot and demanded the restoration of the old Bubon white flag with its free de laïs. This will never have been accepted by the army or by the middle and lower classes, and Mark Mahon himself saw that the demand was politically impossible. Cambodia, however, refused to sacrifice his principles, and MacMahon then resolved to wait for the death of Cambodia when the next prince in line, the Orlean Comte de Paris, grandson of Louis Philippe, will have no objection to the banner of the revolution and Napoleon. To keep the place warm for him, the assembly voted to confer the presidency of MacMahon for seven years. That the royalist hope were eventually cheated was partly due to a few determined Republicans like Gambita, who did some strenuous, sorry, strenuous electioneering, strenuous electioneering in the provinces, and from 1873 to 1875 secured the return of 26 Republican candidates in 29 by elections by the assembly. Gradually, then, the political complexion of the assembly changed. 
the eventual uh, and eventually in 1875 the monarchists had a sulky to agree uh, to the passing of new constitutional laws the decisive measures which ensured a permanent republic being passed by a majority of only one vote france was given a parliamentary democracy with a chamber of deputies elected for four years by the vote of all males a senate above this with a considerable degree of power and a president chosen for seven years by chamber and senate together the president could select ministers but since he could not uh, dissolve the chamber except with the consent of the senate and since the cabinet was re Responsible for the chamber and not to the president. The, the latter uh, uh, eventually became a kind of figurehead corresponding to a British constitutional monarchy. Became a kind of, uh, sorry, uh, though this was not originally intended. When Mark Mahone supported uh, by a royalist senate dissolved a new elected chamber in 1877 largely because it was too republican for his liking. He was taught an emphatic lesson by the return of an even bigger republic majority. Soon afterwards, he resigned to make way for the undoubtedly, uh, um, the, the undoubted though conservative republic, the president of the chamber of deputies, the former president of the assembly. Jules Gray. Sorry, Jules Gravy. The Third French Republic, founded in the hour of defeat over the blood of the communards and against all the desires of the monarchists, endured surprisingly well. In spite of fraud, party divisions, and the First World War, it lasted for 60. Uh, five years, nearly four times as long as any other government since the downfall of the old monarchy in 1791, until it collapsed under the weight of defeat in 1940. It weathered too, a number of severe internal crises, notably in the Bo 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 Bolanga affair, the Panama scandal and the Dreyfus case. Crisis in the early history of the Republic. The Bolanga Affair, 1886. In 1886, General Bolanga, ex-military governor of Tunis, a newly, uh, uh, newly appointed minister of war, began to capture the attention of the French people. His hand, some appearance on his black horse, his fiery speeches, his prophecies of successful war of revenge and the recovery of the uh, Alcique Lorraine, his attacks on the new constitution, his concern for the welfare of the troops, all powerful affected certain sections of the people. Among these were men both of the right and of the left, with the result that his colleagues soon became alarmed at his popularity. In May 1887, they dropped him from the ministry, only for his reputation to increase still further with the decline of the gravy, whose son-in-law was found to be selling honors within the presidential gift. The government then in March 1888 forced Bolanga from the army with the support of many sections of the public from royalists and Bonapartists to unemployed workers. He then started putting his name forward as a candidate in the constitu constituency where there was a vacancy and, uh, and, and came with a great victory in Paris in January 1889. And excited crowds arguing him on the LEC, the presidential palace. Obviously, the general was aiming at a coup d'etat and a dictatorship, but in fact, he feared to take the final step. At length, the divided Republicans plucked up their courage and determined to charge Bublanga with treason. At this gorgeous bubble collapsed the general's flight to Brussels and suicide two years later on the grave of his mistress showed that he was not of the stuff of which real dictators are made. The Panama Scandal in 1892 the Panama scandal of which burst in the year 1892 was only noteworthy in that it provided the enemies of the Republic with a powerful weapon. The success of the Suez Canal, planned by a great Frenchman, Ferdinand D. Lips, 
sorry, Le Peace, Ferdinand D. Le Peace, had encouraged the idea of a similar project through the uh, Ishmas ish of Panama. The scheme, as we know, has proved to be of great service. The Panama scandal was eventually built by the uh, sorry the Panama Canal was eventually built by the USA between 1904 to 1913 but as undertaken by the Dilly Lips Lesips it collapsed disastrously. A company was successfully f uh, floated in 1880 with the Lesips as president but after several years work it went bankrupt in 1889 the elderly daily Le 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 sips himself a cousin of the ex empress eugenic uh, or, or eugenie and since the opening of the Suez canal loaded with honors ended his career in disgrace not only was the technical planning of some place faulty such as allowing in a fee, uh, insufficiently for the tropical floods of the Ch Chagres River, but on the uh, investigation in 1892, it became uh, uh, it became clear that an amazing amount of extravagance, fraud, bribery, and even blackmail had been taking place. The worst feature was that the many deputies and senators were rightly thought to have accepted bribes to advance the project. One ex-minister was actually convicted, with the result that the enemies of the regime in France could talk of Republican corruption. Delisips was condemned to five years imprisonment, a sentence afterwards annulled, and thousands of French investors lost their money. It was a nasty blow, and it caused many French electors to vote socialists as the, the, uh, uh, the, the, at the next elections. The Republican, however, survived. The Dreyfus case of 1894-1906. The Bolanga episode and the Panama scandal were peace and quiet compared with the Dreyfus case which distracted the French nation, nation from 1894 to 1906. In 1894, Captain Alfred Refuse, a wealthy Jewish officer from uh, Alsaki, was condemned by closed court martial to a life sentence on Devil's Island for selling military secrets to the Germans. The case rested on an, uh, sorry, on one half of an undated, you know, undated and uh, unsigned document extracted from a waste paper basket in the German embassy and said to be a dazeful writing, a matter on which there was not agreement. Conviction of Day Reefers in 1894. His race and personal unpopularity, however, are told ag against him. The nature of the trial and Dreyfus sustained protestations of innocence led to his relatives and a few others to try reopen the case. But for long without success, however, the fact that leakages of information still went on, though Dreyfus was now on Devil's Island, proved suspicious. In 1897, another officer, a notorious extravagant but uh, well-connected major named uh, Esther Hazy, uh, was accused thanks to the work of Colonel Piquet, a newly appointed head of French military intelligence who dared to risk the hostility of his colleagues by questioning the previous verdict. They're all risk uh, uh, being quite caught for his pains was a posting to a danger area in Tunisia and uh, the new uh, court marshal took only three minutes to acquit Esther Hazy. Zola's campaign 1898 at this point in January 1888 the great French novelist that is the Emile Zola entered the scene he wrote a remarkable open letter published in the press to the President of the Republic. He began almost every paragraph with the word, accuse. 
F Qs and his specific charges were directed not only to Esther Hazy but at the Minister of War and other military chiefs, whom he accused of suppressing the truth, and at 300 writing experts uh, whom he accused if they were not insane of fraud. He finished by inviting prosecution for libel, which he got together with a sentence of one year's imprisonment. This he avoided by going abroad, round about at the same year imprisonment. Uh, uh, he avoided by going abroad. The military authorities further uh, victimized uh, Pakuat by dismissing him from the service for professional faults, i.e. failure to stay quiet when required. Dismissal of Pakuat, the two camps. By this time, by this time, the public uproar was stupendous. Half France was clamoring that a great injustice had to be done to Dreyfus. The other half held that to stay or to say this was to attack the honor of the army, which had sentenced him. Though there were some curious cross currents of opinion, the strongest supporters of uh, Dreyfus tended to be the convicted, uh, the convinced Republicans and the intellectuals, while on the other side were those who yearned for the old France, the monarchists, the clericals, the upper class elements which still occupied many of the high posts in the army. Many of Trefio's opponents were actually uh, were, were actuated by crude, uh, crude anti-Semitism, which was becoming stronger as Jews took an increasing part in high finance. And in these critics of capitalism on the left sometimes joined hands with clericals in, on the right. One of two vicious anti-Semitic newspapers had made their appearance and the controversy waxed hot and bitter. Private as well as public life was affected. Long-standing friendships were severed. Scores of duels fought. Before 1898 was out, a vital new development occurred. A prosecution was launched against Piquart, now a civilian, in a civil court. A colony, Helen Henry, who had worked throughout in the intelligence office and replaced Piquart at its head found himself expected to provide evidence for this prosecution and did so. But the court came to the conclusion that one of his documents were forgery. He was detained and that night committed suicide. It appeared that he had concocted a whole series of forgeries in an attempt to sustain the verdict against Drifus. At this, Esther Hazy fled abroad, later to make admissions. Justice, it seemed, was at last about to triumph. The minister of war who had upheld the forger race as genuine was forced to, to resign and uh, Dreyfus, white-haired and broken, was brought back from a devil's island to be given a fresh trial. Retrial of Dreyfus, guilty but pardoned, 1899. At this new court martial, the military authorities still unable to see that the honor of the army was set uh, or best maintained by justice rather than by blind loyalty, once more behaved with incredible stupidity and meanness. Instead of acquitting Dreyfus, they now found him guilty with extenuating circumstances and uh, uh, condemned him to 10 years imprisonment. With fine illegal, illogicality, I mean, they coupled with this a recommendation of to mercy. The president of the republic, advised by his newly elected minister of republican defense, then prompted inter promptly intervened to pardon the prisoner. This really settled the matter, but the echoes and passions still lingered. The struggle to uphold the honor of Dreyfus against that of the military leaders went on, and at last in 1806, sorry, in 1906, a retrial was granted before the appeal court. In this, fresh documents completely cleared the character of the Jew, whose only crime was his birth, and the verdict of 1899 was quashed. This did not prevent Dreyfus being shot and wounded two years later by an anti-Semitic journalist. <laughs>
Altogether, the whole affair refused was a most unsavory business. Yet, curiously enough, its effect in the end was to strengthen the Republic. For it brought closer together the radicals and most of the socialists, the Republic's uh, firmest friends, and it discredited the clericals, the monarchists, and the supporters in the army, the Republic's bitter, the, the bitterest enemies. The Bolanga crisis, the Panama scandal, and the Dreyfus case were three highlights in the domestic history of the Third Republic between the Third Republic between 1871 and 1914. There were, however, many other developments, which were less spectacular but equally important. Among these were the laws passed in 1881, 1884, giving complete liberty of the press and the public meeting permission to these exiled and transported after the commune to return, freedom to join trade unions and the establishment of free compulsory education. Round about the same time, the influence of the church was also greatly reduced by the expulsion of the Jesuits uh, and other orders unauthorized in, the, in, in France and by a ban on religious education in the timetable of all schools run by the public authorities. These measures were the work of ministers of convinced republicans in which the leading figure were moderates like Gambetta who had dropped some of his old, old radicalism and Jules uh, Ferry, a group now called opportunists since they sought to put into effect only those radical reforms which commanded widespread support. Opportunist ministers or, or opportunistic ministers were also responsible during the 1890s for passing further laws to regulate female and child labor, to enforce safety measures in mines and factories, and to provide cheap and sanitary uh, dwellings for working men. Radical ministers. Other important reforming measures were passed by the uh, predominantly radical ministers in 1899 to 1905. From 1899 to 1902, the premier was Pierre Waldeck Reçu, a highly able and respected Republican who had helped to legalize trade unions in 1884. A moderate, he formed a what he called a government of republic defense to combat the anti-republican forces in, for example, the army and the church, which had shown their strength during the refuse case. Most of his colleagues were radicals, but his cabinet included for the first time a socialist in Alexandre Mil uh, sorry, in Alexandre Milliron, who was made minister of commerce. Milleran was uh, responsible for some important laws, notably a public health act and a limitation of the working day for, uh, to nine and a half hours. Apart from this, the cabinet was determined first to see justice done in the Dreyfus case, which it did by advising a pardon for, Dreyf uh, for Dreyfus after his second trial, and then to crush the political power of the clericals. It saw in them acting with the militarists the great danger to the Republic. Accordingly, accordingly Waldeck Rousseau was responsible for a law which uh, 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 sc uh, schools run by religious orders were closed unless the associations were approved by the government. His intention was, the approval, uh, was that the approval should not uh, be unduly difficult uh, uh, to obtain, but under his more fanatical successor as Prime Minister, Emile Combes, uh, such approval was systematically refused. The papacy reacted to this by abandoning its recent efforts to reconcile or rally French cavalry leagues to the Republic and Combis, then went on to urge the cancellation of Napoleon's con con concordant, uh, uh, concordant in uh, 1802 by which Catholic Catholicism enjoyed an official position and uh, privileges in France.
This was done under his successor in 1805. The church and state became completely separated. The necessary legislation was largely the work of uh, Aristide Briand, another socialist prepared to work with the uh, radical ministry. Among the radicals who held the uh, premiership uh, uh, between 1905 and 1914 was uh, uh, George uh, Clement Clemenceau, who had long been active in politics both in, as a deputy and as a newspaper owner. Sitting on the far left of the chamber, he was a virulent critic who had uh, helped to bring down many ministers and his journals in one on which Zola published his famous letter had played a leading part in upholding Adrethius and demanding anti-clerical legislation. As a premier from 1906 to 18, 1909, sorry. However, with the strikes, he his use of troops to break this lost him social support. But his uh, successor, the socialist Brian, uh, heading another radical socialist coalition, found himself obliged to resort to the same tactics to deal with the attempted uh, general strike in 1910. It was Brian, moreover, who defeated a railway strike by calling up the strikers to uh, the color so putting them under military discipline. As a background to these events, we must remember that despite the generally depressed economic conditions from the mid 1870s to the mid 1890s and the uh, scourge of, uh, of phylloxera which ruined the vineyards, great commercial and industrial mines, land improvement, steamship services all made great progress. The wealth of the country increased sharply possibly aided by the new colonial policy which uh, began in 1880s. Nevertheless, in spite of the uh, reforms uh, mentioned above, social uh, conditions remained bad. France was still in uh, 1914 a long way behind both British, uh, Britain and Germany in measures to benefit the poorer classes. Old age pensions for and the Germans in measure to benefit the poorer uh, example were frequently proposed by Magdalene, but when finally approved in 1910, were so hedged about with restrictions as to be of little or, or social value. Uh, similarly, there are insurance schemes to which employers uh, had to contribute for nearly all their workers except the high paid. The third passed in 1889 was for pensions in old age or incapacity. This applied to most of the lower paid workers and was based on weekly contributions on one half by the emp uh, employer and one half by the employee with the state making an addition to the actual pension. None of this provision was very generous, but as a national policy to help the worker in, in ill health and old age, it was unique at the time in Europe and well ahead of legislation in Britain. But the social democrats survive. The socialists, however, were not appeased. They saw no real socialism in what they mockingly call this state socialism of Bismarck's. And they found their efforts to secure further social reforms such as limitations of hours, fixed minimum wages and increased powers for the trade unions, all frustrated by the councillor. So they kept up the attack on Bismarck and his attempts to weaken and silence them failed. In 1890, the Social Democrats pulled nearly one and a half million votes, and with the relaxation of the persecution, uh, persecution following the retirement of the councillor in the same year, the figure rapidly mounted until 1914, when it was four and a quarter millions. By that time, by that time, the Social Democrats were the strongest single party in the Reichstag. The battle against the Socialists was far from being one of Bismarck's victories. Progress in the German Empire.
Bismarck's difficulty in subduing first the Catholics and then the socialists did not, however, prevent substantial progress being made in the organization of the empire. Within five or six years in the ceremony of, uh, at Versailles, a common currency and banking system had been established, together with a postal system for the whole empire uh, except Bavaria, which had its own. Railways, though not state-owned, were constructed and coordinated in the state interest. New codes of commercial, civil, criminal and military law were framed. And above all, industry and trade flourished, so that Germany soon became like Britain, one of the workshops of the world, a development or which again had its effect on foreign policy. Abandonment of the free trade in 1879. Before we pass on to a foreign policy, one other important step taken by Bismarck was, must be noted. Late in 1878, he decided to abandon the existing trade policy of the German Empire based on progress towards free trade and to substitute instead uh, protective tariffs. The change was made, he maintained, purely in the interest of the German industries, could never lead to prosperity in a world of competition or competitive nations. Protecting certainly, uh, or protection certainly made a sense as a weapon against the depression of the uh, 1870s and particularly the great agri agricultural depression which afflicted most of the Western Europe, Euro Europe till 1890s. Indeed, Bismarck's tariff may well have further uh, Germany's huge industrial advance in the late 19th century, but what Bismarck did not emphasize was that protective tariffs would ensure for the government a permanent and probably rising revenue from custom duties, very little of which was under the control of Reichstag or the various state governments. And a free trade direct taxes were necessary, which gave the state legislatures an important weapon, as their annual consent to them was necessary under the constitution. Under protection, however, custom tariffs will be voted. Custom tariffs will be voted by Reichstag, that is, for a term of years, uh, years and will make much direct taxation unnecessary, thereby robbing the state legislature of the opportunity of exercising annual uh, their financial power thus in changing the economic system of the country, as he did by introducing in 1879 tariffs against many foreign manufacturers as well as foreign corn. Bismarck was also dealing a shrewd blow to the power of the state parliaments and even the rich stag itself. The last of German liberalism. This move also put the last nail in the coffin of the old Liberty Party based on the parliamentary government and free trade. The party had already split into national liberals, those who came round to support of uh, Bismarck in the 1860s and progressives. Now, over the protective tariffs, the national liberals themselves split, some supporting Bismarck and others voting with the progressives and the social democrats against him. Bismarck was adept of killing two or three birds with one stone and that his old allies, the national liberals, were broken by his tariff policy worried him not at all. Henceforth, he would rely for support in the Reichstag on a majority built uh, mainly around the conservatives and the center, the latter reconciled since the abandonment of the Kulturkampf. Death of William I in 1888. In 1890, to his intense surprise, the elderly and remarkably successful councillor found himself forced to resign. The chain of events which led to his uh, to this had begun in 1888 when the old Emperor William I at last died aged 90. It was his support since the power vested in the emperor was so great that he had enabled Bismarck to overcome all opposition. <laughs>
With his limited intelligence and a strong sense of honor, the Emperor's first instinct had in fact been against nearly all Bismarck's outstanding strokes of policy. The defiance of the liberals in 1862, the lenient peace with Austria in 1866, the assumption of the imperial title in 1871, the Austrian alliance in 1879. But Bismarck had known how to manage him and bring him round to his own viewpoint. A firm partnership had sprung up, and the old emperor's attitude appears in the single word with which he greeted one of the Bismarck's offers of resignation, a customary and powerful weapon. Never! Frederick in 1888 Bismarck's officers of resignation, that is, unfortunately, William's son and successor, Frederick, came to the throne in the grip of a mortal disease, a cancer of the throat. Within three months, this brought him too to the grave. History sometimes turns dramatically on the lives of few individuals. Frederick, through a great German patriot, had as uh, crown prince shown himself liberally inclined. Married to Queen Victoria, uh, Victoria's eldest daughter, he, 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 he shown himself, you know, had developed a more constitutional idea of kingship than his father. The carrying out of his ideas must have spelled ruin to much that Bismarck had stood for. When death took him soon, he, the last hopes of a liberal Germany disappeared, and a great lot of, uh, you know, vanished from Bismarck's mind. William II, that is, in 1888-1918. Frederick was in turn succeeded by his son William II, a brilliant, uh, you know, versatile, though unshakable young man of 28. The new monarch who had been carefully trained in the Bismarckian principles, announced his intention of following the edged councillor's policy and concentrating not on the traditions of his father but on those of his grandfather. Nothing could have been more welcome to Bismarck, who now saw himself as secure in his councillorship to the end of his days. Yet within two years, to the amazement of the Europe, and uh, const uh, you know, co consternation of his own countrymen. The young and inexperienced William had parted with the uh, statesman who had made the German Empire. The differences had rapidly become acute. The headstrong emperor longed to carry out his own ideas, which were opposed by the councillor. At home, Bismarck wanted to continue persecuting the socialists whereas the emperor wished to reconcile them. In Europe, the emperor apparently preferred to uh, assure Austria-Hungary of Germany's friendship in all circumstances and let Russia go hung. Bismarck's policy of keeping a foot in, the, in both camps and strictly limiting German's obligations to Austria-Hungary was far too complicated to his successors. Austria, Hungary and Germany must control the Balkans between them. Though the Emperor and that left uh, uh, little room for friendship with Russia. Finally, on the vexed question of acquiring colonies, the Emperor insisted on immediate German expansion and the construction of a fleet which could hold its own against any other, a policy Bismarck had largely avoided since it will inevitably antagonize Britain. Bismarck, therefore, reminded the emperor of the rule that the councillor alone was entitled to present advice, that is, advice to the crown, whereupon William demanded that Bismarck should, be, should advise him to alter the rule. The councillor, horrified at the idea of being reduced to the level of the other ministers, replied that he could never serve all his knees. That is, he could never serve on his knees. Pressed to a tender, to tender his resignation, he at last did so. The veteran pilot was dropped. Germany under Bismarck's successors, that is 1890 to 1914.
It is not necessary to describe the domestic policies of Bismarck's successors as imperial councillor before 1914. Caprivi, that is uh, Caprivi, and uh, Bulo and uh, Bath, Bath Maholi, they were all overshadowed in the public eye by the flamboyant young uh, soon naval power and uh, to present a model to Europe in the way of welfare legislation, a municipal enterprise and public education. It also remained for all the uh, uh, universal suffrage and the increased in increasing public support for the for the socialists now relieved uh, relieved of the laws against them. A state with many aristocratic features, the predominance of Prussia and the Prussian army tradition, and the fact that the imperial ministers were responsible not to Reichstag but to the emperor kept Germany well short of being a full constitutional state on the lines of Britain or France. And this, as we shall see, had unfortunate effects on Germany policy and on the peace of the world. The Russian Empire, Internal History, 1881 to 1914. Alexander III, or the Third, 1881 to 1894. Alexander III, son and successor of the murdered Tsar Liberator Alexander II, kept firm control over his subjects. This was not felt to be oppressive by the vast majority, who were not in the habit of blaming their poverty on their ruler. Traditional in their beliefs, they still looked on the Tsar as the protector and father. But by this time, there were also, as we already see, uh, certain groups who had begun to regard the Tsardom as a tyranny. Some of these opponents were liberal-minded noblemen with a belief in free speech and parliamentary institutions but many more were middle-class intellectuals, the product of the new school and universities. Feeling themselves well qualified to criticize or to critique and advise the government, they were intensely frustrated by the absence of any national assembly and by the restriction of free speech and writing. Religious and national minorities. Besides critics of this sort, who, even if they formed secret societies, were essentially groups of individuals, there were also much larger groups who now increasingly felt that Saddam having upon them. These were the religious minorities, like the Jews and the Protestants, and the subject nationalities of the Russian Empire, such as the Poles and the Baltic people. But the Tsars, of course, in no way thought of themselves as of thought themselves of, as of presses. Both Alexander the Third and Nicholas the Second regarded themselves as bound by sacred oath and a duty to maintain the full prayer that the concessions made by his father had actually prompted the growth of opposition and terrorism. And in clamping down on revolutionary activities, he was for several years fully supported by the mass of the country. A Russian policy. Again, of a man who could bend a horseshoe or a, a horseshoe with his bare hands, Alexander the Third had sometimes been called the peasant Tsar. Honorable and straightforward, brusque, shy and simple. He venerated the older traditions of the Russians and was at bed determined not to see this weakened by Western doctrines like liberalism or socialism. Aristocracy, orthodoxy, and nationalism were his ideals, as they were those of Nicholas I, and among his first action as a ruler was to cancel his father's edict. Signed on the eve of the assassination, approving the setting up of a representative commission to confer with the government about constitutional reforms. A strengthening of the autocracy. Under the influence of his old tutor, Pohedonetzi, chairman of the uh, governor council or the governing council of the Russian Orthodox Church and soon Alexander's main advisor. 
the censorship was extended, martial law made it easier to apply, and the independence of the universities restricted, and the powers of the local councils, that is the Zim staff and town dumas reduced. The popular and peasant element of the Zemstav uh, the, 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 was official, uh, uh, also lessened in favor of the upper classes. In the countryside, new leading officials known as the uh, land captains were appointed from the nobility and entrusted with many powers exercised in the previous reign by the local Zemstav and all the elected justices of the peace. Prosecution of Jews The restrictions were as nothing, however, compared with the actions taken by Alexander's government against the religious and national minorities. The treatment of the five uh, million Jews was sheer persecution. The Jews were already confined to a pale or settlement in the south and west. Now they were barred from setting in rural districts, deprived of voting rights from the local council and subjected to a quota system for, uh, for entrance to high schools and universities. No Jews could practice at the bar. No Jew doctor he be employed by the public authority. No Jew soldier became an officer. Was still, when a local mobs driven by hatred or more frequently greed set on a Jewish community on a that is pogrom, a Russian word for destruction, usually involving massacre as well as burning and looting. The Russian police also too often proved to be participants rather than protectors. Such attacks were particularly frequent and vicious early in the reign, the excuse being that one of the killers of Alexander II had been a Jewish girl. The government's anti-Jewish attitude was based on religion rather than race. A Jew could avoid disabilities by accepting the Orthodox Christian faith. A Russian Jewish, Jewish problem would be solved. Pobe Donostev or Donostev um, had declared when one other of the Jewish had immigrated, one that had been converted and one that had been assimilated or had disappeared. In the case of the national minorities, the hostility was to nationality itself. In Alexander's eyes, Non-Russians could be satisfactory subjects of those and, uh, and acted like Russians. Accordingly, in Poland, the government forbade any Pole or Rom the Roman Catholic to hold an official position and burned the teaching of Polish in schools. Even Polish uh, literature was studied uh, uh, from Russian translations. Similarly, in the Baltic provinces, it burned the use in schools of the German language spoken by the ruling class, and in Ukraine and White Russia, it prohibited the teaching of the native tongues and enforced the use of Russian. It also sought to apply less rigor, uh, rigorously similar policies in the Armenian and Central Asiatic regions, while in Finland it made knowledge of a Russian compulsory uh, for public servants and set up a censorship over Finnish newspapers. Everywhere Alexander's object was a Russian sorry, so far as possible. The outlying provinces with all their differences, their different people and traditions must be uh, assimilated to Russian language, institutions and faith. Such a policy, while intelligibly and sometimes wishing to make a strong, centralized, unified and a subser sub subservient state was bound to create immense opposition. Peasant and Factory Reforms, N.K. Bunge, 1881 to 1887. Nevertheless, Alexander III's reign also saw a number of reforms, mainly aimed at easing the load of the peasant. Most of these were the work of Alexander's reforming finance minister, N.K. Bunge, who also secured factory laws appointing uh, inspectors and forbidding child labor. <laughs> 
the chief measures to help the peasants were the abolition of the poll tax, the scaling down of the redemption payments dating from the emancipation and the creation of the peasants bank to help with the purchase of more land, control of peasant movements too were somewhat relaxed to make migration to other parts of Russia easier. Despite such reforms, Russia, uh, Russian agriculture remained stagnant and in the bird uh, season of 1891 to 1892 there were severe famine. Industry, on the contrary, flourished as never before. Something had already been said of the remarkable spot made by the Russian in the 1890s with the help of the foreign loans and of how Alexander's Minister of Communication and latter of Finance, Sigeus Witt, involved the state directly in the building of great new railways such as the Trans-Siberian and in the financing of industry. Witt, whose period of power dated from 1892, came in on a rising tide. During the 1880s, Russia's production of coal increased by nearly 50% of iron by 100% and of oil by 800%, starting, of course, from very low figures. Alexander's policy uh, or foreign policy. Another notable feature of Alexander's reign was his peaceful foreign policy. Though this did not stop the steady Russian advance into Central Asia, it kept Russia from adventures in the Balkans and from pressing too hard against Afghanistan. In his uh, relations with the great powers, Alexander came to distrust Germany, who had chosen as her closest partner Austria-Hungary, a country with which Russia had several possible points of conflict. This led Alexander to develop the ties with uh, France, ties marked by loans and by the Franco-Prussian uh, or Franco-Russian, sorry, alliance in 1892. It was accordingly to a Russia, which was still being ruled as an autocracy, which was in a period of the first industrial growth and which was already allied with France. This Alexander. The third, the, 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 the third son, Nicholas II, succeeded in 1894. Nicholas II, 1894 to 1917. The reign of Nicholas II was one of almost an unveiled disaster. It began at, as it had ended in a tragedy. At his coronation festivities, an open-air gathering for the Moscow people dissolved into chaos as the crowd rushed for free beer and hundreds of people were crushed to death. Agitation in Russia for some years quietened or quietened through a revulsion against Alexander II's murder was by 1894 again grown vigorously. The great industrial expansion uh, of the 1880s and 1890s was producing alarming problems. The population of the towns was fast increasing in the final 12 years of the 19th century. It grew by no less than a third, and great factories were springing up, often with as many as 5,000 workers. The vilest conditions were common in these and overcrowded towns generally in 1885 when a factory act was being prepared. People were found working 18 hours a day while child labor down to three of age in some cases still pers uh, persisted in spite of the early prohibition. So Russia Though still in her industrial infancy, showed in her towns the very worst features of a developed industrialism, overcrowding, slums, appalling factory conditions. The combination of discontent or discontented urban workers with the penniless university students so common in Russia produced a formidable revolutionary movement. Cutter of Nicholas II Ah, Nicholas II himself was the last man who should have inherited the task of solving Russia's overwhelming problems. 
His intelligence was no more remarkable than that of his father, and he had neither Alexander III's powerful physique nor his iron will. Without the brains or determination to run effectively a, a, a village, let alone a state the size of Russia, he was still resolved to rule as a complete autocrat. Even his virtues, such as the religious and loving nature and personal kindness, personal kindness of his family, were those most unfitted for his job. His extremely narrow outlook saw everything in Russia in terms of loyalty to himself, since he knew the honesty of his own intentions. Nothing could be good which did not begin by complete devotion to the Tsar. But to reformers and revolutionaries, nothing could be good unless it began to, uh, by complete de 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 devotion to the need of Russia's downtrodden peasantry and uh, proletariat. Uh, that is a devotion expressing itself in scientific plans for social improvement, not merely in kind, though, thought, or words, or through thoughts or words. Between these two attitudes, little compromise was possible. To the demand for a parliament from those such as the liberal of the Zemstva who still hoped uh, for peaceful reforms, Nicholas II consistently turned a deaf ear. Such ideas he announced were but senseless dreams. The uh, unyielding attitude only produced more supporters of revolutionary violence. In 1898, the Russian Social Democrat Party or Democratic Party was uh, found so to be almost instantly pounced on by the police. And in 1900, the Social Revolutionary Party, the latter was a mixture of many left-wing groups, including Marxists, and uh, but with a strong belief in socialistic progress through the Russian village communes. Social Democratic Party uh, in 1898. The Social Democrats were all Marxists, but also contained many shades of left-wing opinion. For different elements in Marxist um, writings were emphasized by different people. At the Second Party Congress of the Russian Social Democrats in 1903 held in Brussels and hastily moved to London to escape the attentions of the Belgian police, these divisions became very clear. The question which caused the great dissension among the 43 uh, delegates was whether the party should consist uh, purely of uh, devoted workers or whether it should admit passive members. Encouraged subscriptions from a vaguely interested person and persons and so on. The difference was between a party which will be a hundred percent fighting against uh, uh, the uh, fighting organization of professional revolutionaries and one which will be a fear loose body more dependent on public opinion and unable to make great demands on its members. The advocates of the more aggressive organization were led by a revolutionary barrister and strike leader who had served a sentence of four years imprisonment and exile by name originally Vladimir Ilyich Ilyvianov, who he now known as Lenin. His policy was not immediately approved by his followers, uh, gained, uh, uh, and his followers gained a majority of seats on the party executive, and henceforth he and his supporters were known to be Bolshevik status majority men. Since they had won a majority in this uh, Congress, the advocates of a loose party organization became termed as men shall vix, that is minority men. By 1905, the two groups were holding separate Congresses, and by 1911, they had formally separated the Bolsheviks to promote the revolution as soon as possible, the men Sheviks to see first what reform could be achieved by gentler means. Strikes. To the uh, thorough going Marxist, the working classes had two weapons. The final one was armed rebellion. But before that, the strike might be uh, do, do much, mainly through spontaneous discontent, but partly through Marxist propaganda. A wave of strikes now overwhelmed Russia.
a strike in 1895 to 1896 in the 19 uh, or 19 St. Petersburg cotton factories, encouraged among other by Lenin, had a rung from the government and imp uh, an important concession. In the following year, on Waite's advice, a factory act was passed, which limited hours to 11 and a half a day. This success bred other strikes with the demand which became more political, such as freedom of speech and a constituent assembly. In 1904, a big strike among the Baku oil workers with this as well as industrial aims led to, uh, to troops discharging volleys into the uh, uh, not a military alliance but an, 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 an understanding. In form, it was a series of uh, detailed agreements about zones of Anglo-French dissension, notably in North Africa. Here, the terms were the obvious ones. The, uh, the France reorganized Britain's predominant position and interest in Egypt, while Britain recognized France's claim to a similar position, which she had not yet achieved in Morocco. But although so limited in form and uh, intenti, was two years later followed by the first military discussions between the staffs of the British and French armed forces about how to deal with a Germany should that become necessary. Though the Entente was not an alliance in name, it soon became something rather like in fact. At any rate, Germany was offended by it, both because it seemed to shut her out of Morocco and because it announced some kind of Franco-British partnership. The Germans were no longer in a reacting to the new agreement. In March 1905, while Russia was in a turmoil at home and fighting Japan abroad, Germany seized the opportunity to put pressure on France. William II was sent by his ministers to Tangier in Morocco where he made a speech emphasizing Germany's interest there and the importance of maintaining the Sultan's independence. Germany then went on to demand the calling of an international conference to review the whole question of Morocco. And in the French, in view of the Russian allies, trouble felt obliged to agree, despite the arguing of Adèle Cassi, who resigned in protest. The conference duly met on 1906 in Algeciras, or Algeciras in Spain, but Germany got little backing for her view except from Austria-Hungary. Though they accepted that the future of Morocco was an international concern or of international concern and recognized the trading rights for the conference with a valuable gain, they acknowledged, uh, the, the, the acknowledged a right to intervene as necessary to maintain order in the great part of Morocco. This in effect meant the right to control in government or its government. One fact which encouraged them during the negotiations was that a few days after the conference opened, the British Foreign Secretary agreed to, con uh, to contacts between the British and French military staffs. With the intent not only uh, concluded but having survived its first test, France then set about ironing out the differences that is between her two friends. Uh, these two friends were mainly Britain and Russia. The main trouble, the conflicting aims of the two countries in the Middle East, Britain's far concern or Eastern worries had been ended by Japan's defeat of Russia in 1904 to 1905 was soon resolved. In addition, for for swearing or to for swearing expansion on the northern borders of India in Afghanistan and Tibet, the Russians agreed to limit the sphere of influence in Persia and its northern part. Britain's influence was uh, declared to be pre predominant in the south, and a neutral buffer zone was left between. This was called an arrangement to secure the independence of Persia. 
with Russia's expansion in the direction of India and in the Far East checked, there remained only the historic question of the Russian advance in the Balkans. To this, however, Britain had ceased to, atta uh, to, to attach so much importance for the Balkan nations had shown the independence of Russia. And if Russia did get to Constantinople, it would be no worse than having Germany in control there. The latest ambition of it would be uh, William II. So the rifts between Britain and Russia were healed, and the dual entente became extended into the triple entente of France, Britain, and Russia. Triple entente, 1907 to uh, faces triple, uh, that is, faces triple alliance. Uh, by 1907, there was thus at last a substantial counterweight of the German-Austrian-Italian combination alongside and possibly against the Triple Alliance. Austrian-Italian combination that is now stood the Triple Entente. Bismarck, dead by 1898 after eight years, bitter criticism of his successors might well have turned in his grave at so dangerous a development for Germany. The Balkans and the approach to the First World War. The increasing international tension, North Africa and the arms race in 1907 to 1914. Nationalism. By the end of the 19th century, the tide of nationalism was everywhere in the full flood. Two new major powers, that is Germany and Italy, had been born. Belgium had broken away from Holland and Norway was on the point of severing the last ties with Sweden. The Ottoman Empire in Europe had largely dissolved into its common, uh, component national fragments, Greece, Serbia, Romania and Bulgaria. There still existed, however, parts of Europe where a national feeling had been unable to assert itself against a ruling race. Greeks and Bulgars in Macedonia, the region restored itself against uh, uh, you know, the Ottoman Empire by uh, Disraeli in 1878, dreamed of the day of liberation from the Turks. Poles, Finns, Latvians consistently aimed at securing freedom from the Russian masters. Above all, in Austria-Hungary, several suppressed nationalities bitterly resented their subjection. They regarded the dual monarchy as an uh, uh, Austrian device to buy the friendship of the Magyars at the expense of the Zechs, Poles, Ruthenians, Serbs, Croats, Romanians and Slovenes. From one or the other of these dissatisfied peoples, there was sooner or later bound to be trouble. Nationalism as a cause of war. It is clear the national feeling when denied self-expression uh, in the form of independence had been a frequent cause of war. It is also clear that even when nations have succeeded in winning their freedom, wars are not less likely to occur. Desire for freedom for one's own a nation does not necessarily imply recognition of the rights of other nations. In fact, the historical tendency has been the reverse. The greatest age of a national feeling in Europe proved to be also the greatest age of overseas colonization involving the subjection of colored peoples to European ones. Similarly, Strong nations, patriotically pursuing their own national policies, inevitably clashed with one another. Though there were the beginnings of a code of international law in 18th and 19th century Europe, there was on, an, uh, on international authority to enforce it. Or rather, no international authority to f enforce it, sorry. In the state of uh, world organization before 1914, wars were bound to occur, either because nations were not free enough or else because they were too free. International law, but no force to make it respected. 
The power of national feeling was amply demonstrated in the years immediately preceding 1914. As we have seen by 1907, the triple intento of Britain, France, and Russia had emerged as a, uh, sorry, a counterpoise of the triple alliance of uh, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. In the search for national security and in pursuit of their terror territorial ambitions, the European powers had formed themselves into two groups, which became progressive progressively more and more heavily armed and mutually antagonistic. The policies of these groups soon clashed in various parts of the world, and from 1906 a series of incidents disturbed the international atmosphere. The two regions over which the storm clouds gathered heaviest were North Africa and the Balkans. Tangier Incident, 1905 and Algeciras Conference, 1906. The North African question produced two crises within five years. It will be remembered that Germany had objected to uh, France's de de designs on Morocco, had uh, secured an international conference at Algeciras, and had there failed to prevent the French from gaining a major share of control over the Moroccan police, the first step towards general French control over the whole country. Germany, however, was not yet prepared to see Morocco swallowed up by France. When in 1911, following a revolt there, the French dispatched an army into Morocco to help the Sultan keep order. The Germans sent a gunboat, the Panda, and later a cruiser, the Berlin, to Agadir Harbor to protect German interests. This was a violation of the Algeciras Agreement by which France and Spain were alone entitled to policing rights. Britain took a very serious view of the situation fearing that the Germans were seeking to acquire an Atlantic naval base. Lloyd uh, uh, George, then the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, asked this uh, government in a speech at a mansion house banquet uh, or bouquet partially threatened war if British interests in the matter were treated as of no account. The result was that Germany, not prepared to push matters to their own length over an issue of minor importance to her, withdrew and agreed to the establishment of the French protectorate over Morocco. As compensation, she obtained some territory in the French Congo just north of the Cameroons, but this could be uh, not disguise the fact that the Entente had again scored a notable success. Italy also interested in Africa. The list of powers interested in the troubles of North Africa, however, did not stop at Britain, France and Germany or even Spain, now given her own part of Morocco opposite Gibraltar. Italy was desperate anxious or desperately anxious to fill her pockets and vindicate her claim to be a major power by acquiring colonies. We have seen how the French occupation of Tunis on which Italy had herself cast longing glances had been partly responsible for the Italian entry into the Austro-German camp. Abyssinian campaign. Frustrated over Tunis, the Italians planned to absorb Abyssinia. They succeeded in overrunning two coastal strips by the Red Sea, that is Eritrea in 1885 and Italian Somaliland in 1892. But the larger object or their larger object came to grief when the Abyssinians catching an invading Italian army in hopeless inferior numbers won a crushing victory at Adowa in 1896. The result of the battle was the Abyssinian that Abyssinians continued to be ruled by Abyssinians. A state of affairs so outraged to Italian uh, dignity that revenge had actually to be sought to obtain it in 1835. Italo-Turkish War gives Tripoli to Italy in 1911 to 1912. 
and successful in 1900 in picking up anything worth mentioning. The Italians next developed ambitions in connection with Tripoli, the last remaining part of the Ottoman Empire in North Africa. It consisted largely of desert and Italy had no quarrel with Turkey. But these were minor matters to a country eager to colonize. In 1911, taking advantage of the general commotion caused by the al crisis and of certain restrictions on foreign trade introduced by the new nationalistic movement in the Ottoman Empire, Italy declared war on Turkey as the Turkish navy was not strong enough to afford Tripoli. Any effective relief, the Italians were able to capture the province and its neighbor, uh, that is Saire Naikia, from the Sultan with a year, within a year. This action had uh, resulted uh, or had results of importance in European politics. The Triple Alliance was shaken, partly because Germany had uh, herself began to convert Tripoli and partly because Italy had attacked Turkey by this time a center, a center of Germany patronage and commercial development. So in the seven years from 1905 uh, to 1912, uh, uh, North African affairs uh, brought about two threats of European wars, greater ill-feeling among the powers, armed conflict between Turkey and Italy, a strengthening of the Triple Entente and a weakening of the Triple Alliance. The Arms Race, Hague Conference in 1899. The increasing international tension arising from North Africa and other colonies uh, or colonial disputes and uh, from difficulties in the Balkans was soon reflected in European arms race. This danger had already weighed sufficiently with Tsar Nicholas II largely from the economic, uh, for economic reasons. For him to initiate a conference at The Hague in 1899. Here, Russia suggested a five-year halt in arms increase. But here, no positive proposal of this kind was accepted. The lead in rejection came from Germany, who pointed out that Russia could increase her military effectiveness merely by building more railways. Progress was however made in revising the laws of war and framing rules from uh, the humanitarization of warfare, for example, in the treatment of wounded soldiers and prisoners and the prohibition of soft nosed bullets and uh, as if things, uh, sorry, uh, uh, asphyxiating gases. A very important advance was to settle or was the setting up of the tribunal at the Hague to which countries would appeal for arbitration in a dispute. In the next few years, many minor quarrels, such as the Doga Bank incident, were submitted to the Hague Tribunal. As the nations, however, declined to refer to its matters of national honor, independence and vital interest, wars were just as liable as ever to occur. A second Hague Conference in 1907 got little further. A uh, few additionals were made to the first of things indismissible in warfare or inadmissible in warfare and the machinery of the Hague Tribunal was improved but no agreement was reached on the main issue of disarmament where again Germany showed a strong opposition. When Britain expressed a willingness to stabilize naval armaments at existing levels, Germany made it clear that she regarded this merely as the device to keep the German Navy permanently inferior, which indeed in many ways it was. Naval competition, dreadnoughts, Fisher. Europe's progress to destruction now continued space. In 1906, with the launching of Britain's Dreadnought, uh, first of a class of all big gun battleships, a new standard was set in our naval armor, uh, armaments. Admiral Sir John Fisher, first sea lord at the British Admiralty uh, uh, from 1903 to 1910, calculated that it will take the Germans some years to follow. 
scenes to use dread the dreadnoughts effectively they will first have to enlarge the Kiel Canal. His conviction that a war between British and Germany was but a short way ahead was so strong that he actually prophesied a date of October 1914. For the beginning of hostilities, further he even suggested to King Edward in 1908 that Britain should uh, Copenhagen the German fleet, i.e. demand that it should be handed over and on refusal and he let it in the same way as the Danish fleet had been destroyed in 1807. Since war was bound to come, he argued, it might as well come while Britain still held the superiority why wait for the Germans to catch up? Fischer's advice was not accepted, but there were many, both in Britain and Germany, who thought on similar lines and who made the chances of maintaining peace ever fainter. The fact too that Fischer was one of British representatives at the Hague Disarmament Conference in 1899 helps to explain why disarmament conferences then so often since were all conference and no disarmament. In any case, the Germans followed the policy of three pits and Kaiser were not slow to take the next step. The Kiel Canal was widened and deepened. Dreadnought type battleships were constructed. New Navy appeals were passed to big increases in the fleet. Between 1909 to 1912, Germany laid down nine dreadnoughts. Britain consequently laid down eight. The exceptionally heavy armor and short range of the Germany vessels indicated that they were destined for use not far from home, rather than for the distant preservation of colonial connections. The British countered and concentrating 80% of their fleet in the North Sea and by arranging with France that she should look after the Mediterranean. The arrangement stated that there was no alliance between the two countries, but clearly things were moving that way. Military competition. On the military side, the arms contest proceeded with equal fury. The German army was enlarged and trained to the highest degree of efficiency, while the French and the Russians increased the length of conscript service with the colors. Very soon, by calling up a trained risk service, uh, uh, Germany and France will each be in a position to put about three and a half million men into the field, and Russia about four million. Even Britain under her secretary for war, Lord Haldane, organized a small but efficient expeditionary force which could be readily mobilized for service on the continent or elsewhere. Coupled with a new non-regular territory army not limited to home defense, once started it was almost impossible to slow down the arms race. On each side there was a complete lack of trust in the uh, others intentions on each side you know side a big vested interest in the war industry was being created in the form of people ranging from arms manufacturers and shareholders to newspaper proprietors who pro profited financially from a state of international tension german militarism in germany a country always liable to be misled by the power of ideas Certain circles, taking their lead from the historian Treyet Skitche or some of the army chiefs, preached not only on the inevitability but the desirability of war. The theories of uh, Darwin on evolution and the survival of the fittest were perverted to mean that war, the highest form of struggle, is the supreme test of the human race and that by eliminating the unfittest nations and giving greater powers to the fittest, it uh, advances the cause of civilization. The Germans from 1864 to 1871 had been so successful in warfare that they regarded future victory as certain. Then, with the victory achieved, the German culture of science, strength, and a state of supremacy could displace the decadent civilization of France based on liberty and literature, and that of Britain based on comfort and cricket.
the public largely unaware of developments. These ideas, however, were by no means universally held. Nor was this uh, their general recognition of the trend of international affairs. German naval commanders might toast the day Germany university professors might proclaim absurd theories, the Kaiser might rattle his sabre, Fischer might strain at their leash, French and British generals might make military arrangements together, Austrian and Russian foreign ministers might plan diplomatic coups on the Balkans, but the great European public went on blind to the increasing menace of war. Foreign policy, even in a democracy like Britain's, was always shrouded in mystery. Several members of uh, Asquith's uh, cabinet were unaware until the last moment of how far the Prime Minister and his Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey had committed Britain to France. Ordinary British people, although claims, uh, uh, I mean, uh, although, and especially those connected with the sea, resented the new German naval claims. Businessmen claimed the loss of trade to German farms, which were undercutting British goods, particularly in South America. Everyone resented the surrounded uh, the, the Kaiser's speech, but very few people realized what combustible materials surrounded them or what calamity would befall them were it to take fire. Even if I stayed uh, at home and enjoyed the accounts uh, in the newspaper of a breakfast, thus the incurious mixture of the inc inc incidental, the unconscious of the deliberate Europe approached disaster. In truth, it mattered little how much the masses were aware, uh, uh, aware that uh, all Europe had become a power magazine liable to explode at any moment. Europa Powder Magazine The fact of the powder magazine remained. It could have gone off over the North African incidents, though before 1911 the average man had never even heard of Al Ghadir. And now, in 1914, though the average man did not know Sarajevo from the Sarahara, the catastrophe was to come all the same from the Balkans. The Balkans, 1878 to 1914, the guns go off. Racial discontent in the Balkans. The fact that most of the subject races of the Turks had gained independence during the 19th century had not brought lasting peace to southeastern Europe. As we have seen, by 1878, Greece, Serbia, Montenegro, Romania, and Bulgaria had all been formed from the Ottoman Empire. At the end of the century, however, the Greeks and the Bulgars uh, of Macedonia and the Albanians were still under Turkish rule. The districts of Bosnia and Herzegovina, too, containing a million subs, while nominally will under, uh, you know, the, uh, the still under Turkish sovereignty, had been administered since 1878 by Austrian Hungary. Trouble might easier arise from these unliberated districts. Further, the formation of four or five new states had merely multiplied the conflicting national policies of the Balkans. No state was satisfied with its existing boundaries, while to most of them, revolution and fighting came almost as second nature. Romania the history of southeastern Europe from the Congress of Berlin to the First World War is neither simple nor edifying. It will be fruitless to attempt to follow it in detail. Beyond the Balkans Peninsula at the north east, Romania, whose ruler proclaimed himself as king in 1881, experienced less violent history or less violent history than the actual Balkan states. <laughs> 
The main disturbances arose either from peasant revolts against bad economic conditions or from the traditional Romania persecution of the Jews. Until 1908, the main incident which affected her southern neighbor uh, Bulgaria were the expulsion of Russian advisors, the union with Eastern Romania uh, in 1885, in spite of the Treaty of Berlin, a war with Serbia in 1885, and the kidnapping and deposition of the first Bulgarian prince in 1886. In Serbia, restless intrigue among politicians and the army led to the brutal crime of 18, sorry, sorry, of 1903. When a number of uh, conspirators broke into the royal palace, tracked the Ob uh, Obrenovic king and his queen in the dark to their hiding place in a cupboard, murdered them as they sheltered in each other's arms and threw them out uh, their outraged bodies out of a window. The coup was completed by a purge of other opponents, after which uh, Karagiorovic naturally ascended the throne. Of the other Christian countries, a Greek went to war with Turkey in 1897 about the future of Crete and Macedonia, but was badly beaten inside three weeks. Turkey. In the Turkish Empire itself, the main excitement was caused by the hideous mis uh, government of Abdul Hamid II. Following unrest among the Armenian subjects in Asia Minor, he organized extensive massacres of the unfortunate Christian race. These were carried out by the Armenian fierce Mohammedan neighbors, the Kurds, with the help of the Turkish troops. Abdul Hamid, not surprisingly, became known as the, in Britain as the Great Assassin and in France as the Red Sultan. In six weeks alone, in the year 1895, over 30,000 Armenians were butchered. In the following year, the order was given to attack the Armenian quarter in Constantinople and 6,000 were slaughtered in two days. The whole appealing episode seemed to illustrate the grim gist that while Christianity provides mass, uh, ma matters, Mohammedans create them. The power of course protested by too little avail. Young Turks in Power, 1908 these events were regarded as a standard Balkan activity and had little effect on the main stream of European history. 1908, however, saw some momentous changes which led directly to general warfare. In that year, a revolution known as the Young Turk movement broke out of the Ottoman Empire. The conspirators aimed at imitating the methods and efficiency of the West in a fervently nationalistic attempt to check the rapid decline of the Turkish power. They demanded a parliament, an unmodern constitution, and to strengthen Turkey were prepared to allow Christian subjects equal privileges with Mohammedans. Fostered in a Paris by exiles, the movement uh, in 1908 transferred to Macedonia, where it was officially proclaimed. Sympathetic Turkish regiments prepared to advance and install the leaders in Constantinople. Finding himself without support, Abdul Hamid agreed to restore the constitution which had been momentarily in force in 1876. The censorship was relaxed, over 80,000 exiles returned, the different subject races seemed closer than brothers, and liberals all over Europe rejoiced. Within two or three months, the picture began to look different. Talking or taking instant advantage of the natural organization at Constantinople, Bulgaria proclaimed herself freed from the last shreds of her dependence on Turkey and elevated her prince into a Tsar or King. Austria-Hungary annexed unconditionally the Turkish provinces she was administering, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Crete proclaimed itself united with Greece. Serbia and Montenegro demanded a rectification of their frontiers. In fact uh, of these uh, uh, events, the young Turks naturally lost their desire to improve the lords of Turkey Christian subjects, especially when the Christians began to demand not reforms but independence. When Abdul Hamid tried to restore our 
he was deposed. But the young Turks soon had additional reason to concentrate on their nationalists rather than on their democratic aims. In 1911, the problems of Turkey tempted the Italian to seize Tripoli quite wantonly for her or from her. Uh, uh, to, and before this difficulty was over, Turkey in 1912 suddenly found herself confronted by a union of the Balkan powers who momentarily put aside their mutual hatreds for the purpose of despoiling the Ottoman Empire. The Balkan League was largely the work of an astute Greek politician, uh, Venizelos. It found its opportunity to attack Turkey in the fact that the young Turks had now, like their older brethren, began persecuting Christians in Macedonia. Disunited in home affairs and with the Italian attack barely over, the uh, Turks could do nothing again uh, against the combined onslaught of Greece, Serbia, Bulgaria and Montenegro. The Allies soon overran different parts of Macedonia and made other conquests. In 1913, a peace conference met at London and by the treaty then concluded Greece acquired Crete, Salonika and South Macedonia. Serbia was rewarded with North and Central Macedonia and the Bulgarians received the race and a stretch of the Aegean coast. <laughs> 